today's class, the worm farming and compost teas. Basic and advanced setup for creating your own worm bin and microbial rich inoculants. And how to multiply those microbes and spread them around your farm is what we're going to focus on today. It'll be a, a very basic overview of both subjects. We could spend weeks, months, and even years on every one of these subjects that we present here at the school. But um, the whole goal is to give you guys uh, uh, some kind, some meat, you know, some uh, something to grab onto, some inspiration, some core knowledge, and then you can take it home and dive deeper into these subjects. Like I said, you could study these subjects for years, each one of them in individually. Um, before we get started today, I wanted to recognize a couple um, key community members that have become team members of the um, Institute of Natural Farming. And number one is uh, is Alex back here, if we could get a round of applause for Alex. And the reason we're giving a round of applause is because he has stepped up to be the multimedia branch of the school. And he's been filming everyone, and you could see from the first one till now just how we quickly advanced in our technology and our presentation. And we're presenting now on YouTube. We have our own channel, so I'm asking everyone to go subscribe to that as well. And that's if you just search Institute of Natural Farming. We're the only channel with that name. So you can find, we have four videos so far. That was the four uh, classes we did in, in uh, July. And, um, and Alex is the main man behind that, making it happen. If he wasn't doing it, it wouldn't be up there. And these classes would just be the three hours that go by and then they're gone into oblivion. But since uh, Alex stepped up to the plate, we got them uh, now captured for all eyes to see from now till they get censored or erased, or maybe uh, if that doesn't happen, they'll be there for it for a long, long time. <laughs> yeah, big up, Alex. Give thanks for that. <clears throat> the other crucial community member I want to recognize at this time is ja Angelo. Angelo has been leading the uh, the morning uh, praises sessions that we do with the Nyabingi drum and chant, which is a traditional Rastafarian praise and uh, celebration and just a way to, uh, to also strengthen the community, strengthen our spirit, and, uh, and get that charge going in the morning because we have these long days and we want to charge our batteries up. And drumming and chanting helps us do that. And Angelo also has been really instrumental with helping keep the grounds clean outside and also keeping the school clean and tidy, and uh, we give thanks for that. So a round of applause for Angelo. <laughs> Crucial brethren. All right. Um, so since we got that out of the way, you guys ready to get started? Yeah. All right, cool. Worms, bro. I'm super excited. Uh, Angela, if you want to grab me just one of those jars of worms out there. Worms are crucial element to a natural farm. Worms are a sign of fertility. Worms are basically our best friends on a farm. Worms, uh, I like to refer to them as our, as our best employees. They don't complain. They work 24 hours a day and they don't want pay except for your garbage. <laughs> right? Man, what a good exchange, bro. These guys in there just working nonstop. You're sleeping, they're working. You're eating, they're working. You're going to the bathroom, they're working. You know, so they just keep going. 24 hours a day, they're just eating. Um, I love worms. Like once you kind of get a relationship going with them, that you just realize their importance. You realize how much they're giving back and, and how little they take. Um, let's see. I'm going to play a little quick video just to get us started. This is a dive into the worm bin um, at my house I took this morning. And I just wanted to show you guys pulling back some of the organic matter. And there's your composting worms. So just a quick video just to kind of get you in the mood. <laughs> We're talking about worms today. A worm is super simple. It's not made of too many uh, parts. This is basically the scientific breakdown of the worm. They call it a front end, a back end. It's rings or segments. And then the cl clitellium is that, uh, is that smooth kind of fat center that you always see on a worm. Um, it is true that if, you, if a worm gets cut, as long as it has this attached to it and a good amount of body, it'll regenerate again. Um, there's some really cool stuff about worms. But the species that we're going for are red wigglers. 
They are the champion of composting. So we're talking about worm bins today. We'll also get into how to cultivate native worms on your land too. There is, there is ways and methods to do that as well. But we're talking mainly about worm bins and composting bins to uh, help mitigate your food waste and to add a microbial dense um, product to your arsenal of farming products. And for that we want red wigglers, champions. There are other species. There's a, a blue Indian worm. Some, some worm bins uh, in other countries utilize night crawlers. But native worms in particular are not good for worm bins. You don't use a native worm in a worm bin. They serve a whole different purpose. Most native worms are deep tillers. They will, um, they will, they're more known for digging down, eating organic matter, taking it down, making aeration, making tunnels down through your soil, bringing nutrients, slimes, bacteria, fungi, protozoa down into the soil. Composting worms like to live in the top six inches and even more particular the top two inches of soil is where the composting worms thrive the most and you'll see the most activity. How's it going guys? There's a few extra chairs. There's another chair here. There's space over here or wherever you feel comfortable. Um, so yeah so um, night crawlers uh, yeah so we're, we're talking about composting worms right in that top top layer of soil um, your average red wiggler can consume one to three times and even scientists have documented more than three times their own body weight in food per day. So um, the, the amount of food scrap you're adding in will equal the amount of worms. So we're going to talk about food to worm ratio also shortly. These are just a few more images of the worm bin. And what I want you to make note of is um, all the different size of worms you see in there, from adults to babies to uh, adolescents. Um, and here you can see the, uh, those other larvae there. You see those larvae? The soldier fly larvae. I have a couple samples here so you guys can identify these. Um, I'll pass that around when we talk a little bit more about soldier flies. And um, I just want you to make note that there's not only worms in here, but there's predator mites, there's springtails, there's, uh, there's a whole uh, protozoas, there's nematodes, there's a whole myriad of beneficial microorganisms that are attracted and live in a composting worm bin. Uh, you can see right in the middle, you see that amber colored round ball in the middle? That's a, a, a red wiggler cocoon. Contains two to three babies. So that's how they, they reproduce. We'll go over that some more too. So a um, couple more fun facts. Um, they're hermaphroditic. They're, they're both sex. All worms are both sex. And any two worms can produce offspring. Can they mix interspecies? So like a nightcrawler with a... Uh, that that I've, I've not heard of, no. But I don't have the exact answer for you either. But I've, I've not heard of that happening. Okay. Yeah, just a few, few fun facts. And then um, the whole reason that we're doing this, right? Okay, well, let, me, let me go through these fun facts first. The worms feed on microbes more than they're eating the organic matter. So let me say that again. The worms are eating the decay that comes off of your organic waste, there's an avocado and another avocado, as those break down through microorganisms, the worms then come eat the microorganisms, the waste products of the microorganisms. Mostly these red wigglers love to eat protozoa. That's their main food source. And, that, and the protozoa are all over that decomposing food, just gobbling it up. So the things that are actually eating the organic matter itself are not the worms. They, they do consume a little bit, but they're the microorganisms that we talked about in the microbe class, in the KNF classes, those guys are breaking the material down. That's why you'll come out and on your orange rind you'll see a fuzz, you know, you'll see a, a little mold growing, whether it's green, white, brown, black. Those guys are breaking it down. 
Other things that your eyes don't detect are breaking it down. And then these worms that we do see, the springtails we do see, the predator mites we do see, the um, soldier fly larvae we do see are eating those microorganisms. The juices off of the de decaying compost matter and uh, some organic matter, but very little. Remember, they're, they're, remember how small their little mouths are, you know? So, there's another product that comes off of your worm bin which is called worm juice. It's a liquid, a brown liquid like this. High in fulvic and humic acid, which, they, which, which, a, which you could buy at a grow store or a farm and garden store for like, what, probably 500 bucks a pound or something you're paying for like a real high grade humic, humic acid uh, granules. So we're getting it for free all day long, you know? And the whole reason that we're doing this is for this, right here. This is just high grade worm poop, AKA worm castings. I'm gonna pass this around and you can check it out and you can kind of even fold it around and just see, you know, you'll see some bugs come to the surface. You'll see something jump around a little bit. You'll see these white little mites in there, all beneficials. You want me to tell you a little secret of how you can tell a beneficial bug compared to a non-beneficial bug? The, the secret, the one tip and clue to clue into is how fast they're moving. A predator is going to go rah, 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 and eat stuff real fast and move around fast scouring for, for uh, food. A beneficial predator. A, something that's like hurting your plant is going to sit there and vampire your plant. It's going to suck the life juice out of it. So you'll just see them clustered and sitting in one spot. And maybe they won't even move till you touch them. And then they'll go, oh, okay, I'll move. You know, and that could be anything from aphids to, uh, to spider mites to a whole myriad of non-beneficial microbes and, and, uh, and macrobes as well that you can see. But anyway, the, the one clue, and when you look through there and really let your eyes adjust to it, you'll see fast moving predator bugs all over there. Because all they're doing is going through here, scouring all the food off of, of the, uh, the microbial chain of, of life, the web of life. One more fun fact, in the 1800s and early 1900s, agricultural loans were given by how many worms you had per square foot in your soil. I'll say that again. You could get an agricultural loan from the U.S. government based upon the worms found on your farm. So if you had high populations of worm, you're more likely to get an agricultural loan because they know that your success was right around the corner and your ability to pay back that loan was high. So these guys aren't no joke, man. These guys are making farmers money ever since, you know? So saving you money and making you money, no brainer. We need to make worm bins, right? So there's that gold right there. That's, uh, that's castings that I, that I screened. So the ones going around here, I didn't screen yet, but these ones are screened, so they went through a, an eight, a one eighth screen, uh, a one eighth minus screen, and, and now you got these really fluffy castings similar to something you would buy in the store for $50 a cubic foot. $50 a cubic foot. So this cubed, basically, is $50. You can make these all day at your farm for free. And not only for free, for all those other benefits they're gonna give you too. So why? Why are we making uh, worm castings? To process waste and reduce our rubbish. To reduce uh, landfill uh, intake. To reduce your carbon footprint. To reduce your trash footprint. To reduce your human waste footprint. All that stuff. You know, these guys are gonna help compost our food scrap really fast, clean, and without any smell, which is really key also. Inside a, inside a worm bin is basically, in other words, sterile in the, in the way of positive microbiology. It becomes a sterile environment. And that's why if you smell those castings, they're all made from rotten food. Do they smell like rotting food? No, because it's, it's all sterilized, and by sterile I don't mean free of microbes, I mean only coated in positive microorganism. That's the real definition of sterile, and that's the real definition of this world before uh, Babylon or before we poisoned it. 
was that everything smelled good and everything was in balance. You know, the rot would soon be overtaken by positive microorganisms to help balance that decay. You know, so even the human waste system, the food that went in and the microbes in the belly, what came out the backside wasn't that stinky. It was, re it was just real food. And then that could be used on your farm because it was so clean and pure. It's already been pre-digested by microbes in your belly. So we just, we've been led astray and worm bins can help bring us back, you know, bring us back into what is, what is real, what, it, what do we need to be focusing on. So the castings are microbial dense. The, once we have the castings, that's what we're going to use for our compost tea inoculant as the, as the best inoculant. Number two would be homemade compost or forest compost, forest duff or forest floor. The combination of the three in a compost tea, even better. But we'll get into that when we get into compost teas. So we talked about that it's rich in fulvic and humic acids. Those aren't easy to come by in nature. Mostly composting and worm composting and long periods of time in an old growth forest create complex humics and fulvic acids, which are basically the building blocks of our life. They help transpire nutrients through the cell wall. They help move nutrients up and down the, 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 um, the plant and our bodies. So something we could even talk about for a whole class is humic and fulvic acids. So something you could look up and get more deep into and why they're important to be abundant in a, uh, in a system, a uh, farm system. Um, we're going to cut costs. We've already talked about that. Um, and how we're going to cut costs. We're going to increase our soil and our plant health through using compost teas and worm castings. In so doing so, we don't buy pesticides. We cut back on fungicides. We cut back on fertilizer bills. So in teaming with nature and working with these homemade products, we no longer need to depend on the corporation. So you're saving lots of money, Aaron. Sorry to interrupt. It's all good. Um, so what's the potassium content from the worm casting? So they, like the NPK of, of worm castings is pretty low, but they, are, they do have a trace amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium present. Um, I think like if you were to buy like a bag of castings, it would it'd usually read out to like 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, or something like that on the NPK chart. But... Um, you know, that's kind of uh, something that could be explored further with some searching and even some experimentation. I don't have the exact answer for you right now. Um, but they do have trace elements in them as well and macronutrients like the NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are present, not in highly abundant amounts. But that goes back into, we, I'm going to get into when we show you the worm bin setups, tailoring your food to create outcomes you want. So you want high potassium, you feed them banana peels and bananas and, and, uh, and then the, the castings will reflect the food you gave them. Okay, I'll get into that more in a minute here. Okay, so the principles of a worm bin. I'll pass these around too. I want to talk quickly about, you can, I'll start these over here. These are just my, uh, Soldier fly larvae, there's another picture of them here. And you probably will see these in your worm bin. If you go home or if you've already had one, you will probably see these. And I'll just start off with, we're going to go over the principles. Okay, just want to make sure we're all... Oh yeah, IPM, okay. Alright. So yeah, let's start our bin. Principles to follow. So we're going to go over some basic principles of worm bin farming right now. Any questions before we jump into the basic principles? All good? Okay. So the reason I pass those around, you'll see coming up here when we talk about the food. Your container that you choose, and we're going to get more into this, wide over tall. 
So they like surface area. They like the, that top layer and to be able to spread out on it. So a five gallon bucket, sure you could, but one of those bins from uh, Walmart or Costco or something, even better. Uh, a, a bathtub, an old bathtub setup, even better. You know, the more surface area, the more they're gonna, they're, you're gonna have success in this endeavor. Moisture, they love moisture. They can, they can handle up to 90% moisture content. When you saw these worm castings, these were straight out of the bin. Like they probably got like 70 to 80% moisture in them right now. And, uh, and they can handle up to 90, but they still need air. So just keep these in mind. We're gonna go over it. When I go over the design, we'll go over all these things. They need airflow and it needs drainage. You can't just have it all sitting in the bottom of a plastic pail and expect success. You're gonna, that's when you're gonna get those rotten smells. And when you smell rotten smells in your worm bin, you know your thing's going off balance and you gotta correct it. So, airflow, drainage, moisture, container. Next would be your environment. You want your bin in the shade, preferably outside. But they can go under your kitchen counter too, no problem under your kitchen sink, no problem. I even had a vision the other day of uh, imagine restaurants, right? They could, because en people engineer stuff all day long. I mean, they've engineered the restaurant how it works today, right? But so all we need is the engineer to go in and they have those industrial countertops. They got their hoods and their fryers and all that, their prep counters and their prep things. Well, right underneath, you just have your worm bins, like all sterile and super professional. So when the guy's done chopping, he just scrapes it off the back and it falls in the worm bin. And you could easily engineer like these sterile type worm bins, no smell in every single restaurant in America and it, it could mitigate 50% of their waste and then they could be selling that as a byproduct or giving it away to the community. So that, what I'm saying is the future is bright and each one of us hold the keys to making the future what we want it to be, you know? So, so these, these ideas that come to us out of nowhere through our ancestral DNA, through, uh, through our ancient wisdom, through uh, spiritual guides and teachers showing us new ideas that weren't your own, but all of a sudden you got them, those are yours to act upon. So we gotta pay attention to those kind of things. Uh, back to the worm bin. Um, you obviously don't want it to be in direct sunlight because the temperature can get too hot. They can handle some heat, but they like it cool. You want to cover the top of your bin. You want to keep them in darkness. And you want that airflow. So when you cover it, you're not going to seal it, is what I'm trying to say here. Food. Let's talk about food. The number one food that we're going to feed our worm bin is organic waste. I'll show you this. Organic waste in the form of food scrap. Uh, preferably non-cooked food scrap. If you do do cooked, limit the cooked food and keep it to whole foods if possible. So not some like oily stir fry with all kind of teriyaki sauce and stuff like that might not be so kosher for the worm bin, you know? But if it was just the, um, the, the white rice or the brown rice that was left over, you could throw that in there, you know? We're gonna avoid meat and dairy. They don't really eat meat. But you know what does? Soldier flies do. So, what you'll notice when, um, there, that's an actual soldier fly too, just so you guys don't confuse it with like a house fly or something. They're, so, they're way different. Maggots eat meat. Maggots are responsible for rotting things. Maggots don't come in your worm bin because nothing's rotting like that. It's not like this anaerobic rot going on of meat or of substances that need that fly activity. Maggots, you find that on dead, decaying bodies of meat. That's not what we're going for. Those are those worm, those are more of the cocoons, the worm eggs. But what I wanted to show you was back here. So in, the, in this picture here, you're, there, there's an imbalance in my food system to where the soldier fly larvae came in to help. 
So what I mean by that is if, if you overfeed your bin, you'll see soldier flies. And that's not a bad thing. They're just coming to help with the overfeeding. Because once that microbial set and that sensory starts calling in the, the soldier flies, it's for the purpose of decaying something that the microbes that are presently in your bin can't do on their own. So they call in the helpers. And this would be in the form of the soldier fly. And so they're, they're the ones that are going to eat when you have like a big caked up food mass that's not spread out on the surface. Well, when you break that open, you'll see the soldier flies in there. Uh, if you did throw a, a, a leftover chicken or steak or something into your worm bin, the soldier flies will be the ones responsible for eating that. You may see maggots at that point though. If you put meat in your worm bin, you may see maggots because then the, the whole c consciousness or intelligence of the bin will be calling in the, the flies, the house flies, to come eat that meat to deal with it. So the, the nature is so intelligent, it just figures out the order it needs and then it just happens regardless of what we do. So what we do, are, we're just coaching this bin along. We're kind of the caretaker of the bin and depending on how we treat it is the outcome we're going to get. The goal is to keep it mostly worms, if not all worms. A little bit of soldier flies is fine, but we're not making a soldier fly bin. That's a whole different setup. People do make soldier fly bins because they feed them to their chickens. So there is a reason to cultivate soldier flies and the reason would be for a food source for y yourself in the future maybe, but mainly for your farm animals. So they don't only eat uh, organic waste from your kitchen though. There's two types of bins that I like to teach about. And um, one of them is a, uh, is, a, is a food scrap bin. So two types that we're going to focus on today. One is your food waste or food scrap. And that's kind of what we've been talking about and we got pictures of here. But on large scale farms, that, uh, large scale farms and large scale casting producers, they're not going around town collecting people's food scraps. So for a large scale production, they feed them one of three things or a combination of these three things. Compost. Uh, cow manure. or paper, cardboard. And just so you know, these are the, when you're going to pay 50 bucks a square foot for this stuff, this is the stuff you're getting. Mostly these, these are the, the large producers are using these last two methods here. Cow manure from, a, from the waste from a different farm or paper and cardboard, a waste from other industries. And that, that's mainly, uh, uh, even sawdust is even used on large scale. So would you want to use these castings on your farm or these ones if you were a, a, a farmer? <laughs> Right, so we don't we don't really need these these uh, these to deal with buying fifty dollars a, a cubic foot from worms that were fed cardboard and whipped to death and told to work and just not really treated right, you know, mids. slaves, you know, mids, right? These are your midsy uh, midsy castings, where these ones that you made at home are your high grade castings. But not to stop there, at home I have a bin just that I feed this. So I'll go, I'll go down and I'll scrape my compost from underneath my, uh, my, my organic matter that's decaying and get all that nice rich compost from underneath and then I'll spread it on top of my worm bin. And I have one just dedicated to compost and I'll show you a picture of that soon. So um, you can just feed them finished compost and they'll re-digest it and eat it. And uh, the guy that I learned worm farming from He's a large-scale worm uh, farmer in, uh, in Chico, California, 
and he uses compost that he makes on his property in large amounts to feed his worms. He doesn't give them anything else. Um, number three though, number three is kind of key. Where did I put that? I'm gonna, I'm gonna also add a number three in here. And uh, this, this would be, this would be like your advanced advanced bin, we can call it for now, or your, uh, your tailor-made castings. And what I mean, what I mean by that is, when, is like when, uh, when you ask the question about do the castings have potassium, you can start feeding your worm bin the same dry amendments you would feed your plants. So, you could, so if you're gonna spread kelp on your farm, you're gonna spread rock dust on your farm, you're gonna spread uh, calfos dust on your farm, um, neem cake fertilizer, uh, oyster shell, any of these dry amendments that they use in organic farming, well, you could, you could feed them to your worm bin and pre-digest them. So this is kind of like a secret tech that not too many people teach about or know about, but I've been doing it for years. And, uh, and instead of directly putting your dry amendments on your farm or on your plants or soil per se, you feed your dry amendments to your worms first. You let them pre-digest it, coat it with um, probiotics, partly broken down, way more bioavailable, and then you use those castings on your farm or in a tea. Right? It makes a lot, lot, lot more sense to me. Any questions so far? Good, good. Anything? All right. All right, sweet. Is it all making sense so far? All right. So we got, we got the basics, the principles that we're basically going to follow here. We understand that. Let's get back on track here. Oh, you got to the moisture content 70 to 90%. To 90%, yep. How are you able to de detect how much uh, humidity or moisture? You um, so a, a really easy way to, to understand moisture content is to pick up a ball of soil or whatever, IMO4, when we're making our, uh, our super compost, but you're going to grab it and squeeze it. If it drips, it's at about a 90 to more if you see drips coming out of it. It's oversaturated. If you squeeze it and then just a little bit of moisture comes up in between your fingers here, you're at about 60 or 70 percent moisture and that's that's a good indicator you're, you're at the sweet spot for uh, castings or like IMO4 or something. Can I ask another question? Yeah, man. So when your moisture content is closer to the 90 90 percent range, what kind of processes slow down or gets inhibited by that? So that's versus, when versus yeah. it being on the drier side. Mm -hmm. So the worms prefer it in the eighty percent range. When you start getting in the ninety range, you're really going to get a lot of caking. So your castings and your stuff is just going to start to stick and be like real cakey, stick sticky. The worms will have a harder time moving around and being mobile. Um, also, they will. Uh, they will, um, that's when you'll start to get that anaerobic rot going on. When it starts to smell? It will start to smell because once you have too much moisture, air is not flowing anymore. Right. So that's when you'll get the anaerobic smell at the bottom of your bin, which you're trying to avoid. Anaerobic means without air. Rot. Right? So those are, those are some things we want to avoid. Okay, and we're going to get really deep into anaerobic versus aerobic here in a minute when we talk about compost teas. But um, we're almost done with, um, with this worm section here, which is, uh, it's super basic, but I just want you guys to grasp it all because if you can apply these principles, and by the time we're done with this presentation, you can apply this to any situation, like whatever container you have or whatever your garden is like, you know, uh, you'll be able to take these principles and apply it. So now let's dive into a worm bin setup. So here, this drawing on the bottom is going to be this process that I show over here. So this, this represents a bathtub right here. 
and that's the same bathtub right there. So the bathtub's empty and I put it up on a frame. Uh, it's a simple two by four frame. You know, whatever, whatever works. You could have cinder blocks and just prop it up on some cinder blocks, whatever, is, whatever you got. But you want to get it elevated off the ground or at least have an air gap under. Mainly so you can uh, catch your drippings, your, uh, your worm juice. And uh, at this time I'll pass this around too. And you can just check it out and just smell it and just smell that as neutral. You know, that's, that's my main, the main concern is that I want you to understand that it's neutral. It doesn't stink. It actually smells neutral. And that's always a good thing when making teas, when, uh, when seeing if your juice is on the right track, seeing if your castings are on the right track. They should have a neutral odor or even a good odor. Um, all right, here's your bathtub. First step, I'm, I'm getting softball to baseball size rocks and I'm placing them in the bottom. Step number one. I'm going to pass out shot glasses with their warm <laughs> Got to sign a waiver first. No, <laughs> no yeah, that, that's actually, uh, to tell you the truth, they sell, right now they sell on the market soil in a capsule to re-inoculate your gut. And the same thing you, you need to do is just go out to an undisturbed forest like a Volcano National Park and hike way back where no one's been and just get some of that soil water out of there. I mean some of that soil. Whip it around in a, in a cup, let it settle out and just drink the uh, brown liquid because it's the same thing they're trying to sell you in those capsules. It's just highly diverse microorganisms that are all probiotic. They're all positive. And it's also fulvic and humic acid too. So that's another way to get free fulvic, humic, and stomach microbes. The high, you don't do that with just any old soil. It's got to be that high grade old forest soil that's undisturbed. Whip it around, let it settle out all the way, and drink the, uh, the brown, clear brown liquid. You don't want the solids. Um, back on track here. I'm going to, so we got, I'm just going to redo this drawing so you can see it as we go. We got our, uh, our bin, whatever that may be. If you can find one of these, because a lot of these bathtubs go to waste. People got them uh, sitting in their yard or they're uh, at the junkyards. Um, you'd be amazed. Craigslist people are selling them or giving them away. There's quite a bit of these, uh, these, these tubs and that's the best uh, worm bin. And one of the reasons why this, this tub is so good is because it already comes with a pre-drilled hill, uh, tr <laughs> pre hole right here. And it already, if you set it up level, it already has a downward slope. Slightly sloping downward, right? Because it, it has to drain your water while you're taking a shower. So, so your, your juice is already going to be draining down here into your bucket. I guess the bucket would be more down here. I'm a super good drawler, so, as you guys can tell, but okay. So first step, right? What do we do? We put rocks in the bottom, right? I'm just going to draw it so you can kind of see it build up as well. Everybody learns differently. Some people learn from looking at photos. Some people learn from diagrams. Some people learn through explanation. Some people learn they have to see it be done. So we're going to do all of those today. We're going to show you pictures. We're going to explain it. And then we're going to go do it. So every one of us will have those, those ability to then go home and do these things because we showed you three different ways. We didn't just lecture about it. So what did we do first? We threw down the, the rocks, right? And so that's just for drainage. So we're making a drainage layer right here. Baseball to softball size. Obviously, if you're doing it in a, in a, uh, like a little tote or a bin, you're going to use golf ball to baseball size, you know, and just kind of put the, use the, uh, use the knowledge and just apply it to your situation. So next would come, would be, um, a thin, there's a dog, he's eating worms. The guy will just like eat, he likes to eat earthworms. 
See that drainage hole? I just put a little screen on it, like sunk a little screen with a little, uh, little uh, adhesive and put that in. That'll just help so chunks don't fall down into your worm bin. And there's a better picture of the rocks getting laid in. Number two, we come with this. So this is called weed mat. It is a plastic product, not the, not the best thing to use, but for, for this bin situation, it works really well. And this stuff is like a 20 year rated plastic. It's not just your regular old weed mat. Definitely get this grade of weed mat because other weed mats end up deteriorating over time and you can end up having shards in your castings floating in the air, all kind of stuff just after like two, a year or two years, like it'll start flaking this one will not so look look for that quality weed mat it's not cheap but it's it's the real stuff and then feel free to come up with other solutions that are more natural than this because that's really the goal but the goal with the weed mat is to create a layer of separation between your castings and the rocks and to keep this air layer going so it's for drainage so this has little holes in it it's just that it's full of holes so there's drainage, but the holes are so small, the worms don't crawl through the holes. But the moisture can still drip through it, and that's why I like that product as well. When Dragonfly Earth Medicine saw my bins, they're like, oh, can you figure out how to get rid of the plastic, you know? But it's like, man, like, that's just what works really well and what we have available. But of course, we could always do it other ways. After I show you this, I'll show you some other methods on the ground worm bins. Um, uh, windrow style worm farming so we'll go into some other methods but just work with me here and follow along of this method easiest most uh, uh, applicable okay so we got this weed mat here as a layer to separate our air and our stones from our worms right and then we come with uh, with soil See how I'm starting to lay down that soil? But it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be soil. It's just worm bedding. So the worm bedding is what we'll come with next. And it's just a thin layer. So they have a place to call home when, when you first dump them in there. Because pretty soon they're gonna start eating scrap and c creating more soil and castings. So the worm bedding can be a, a numerous things. Finished compost, peat moss, wet shredded newspaper, wet shredded cardboard, uh, newspaper, cardboard, and compost mixture, um, a bag of castings, whatever, whatever to, uh, to cre create a nice layer for them to, to first house in. So it's just a thin layer of bedding, and that's what you see going in over here. And then I'm basically ready to add my worms and my food scrap. And that's what you see, what you see here is the food waste on the top, the soil and bedding, the rocks, you got that thin weed mat in between, you got your slight drainage, pretty soon you start getting your juice. Next, we're going to want to cover it. So what I have here is just a, uh, an old, uh, there's like a panel from this like plastic shed, and it's just sitting loosely on top. At first I had zero, so what you'll find, especially in the beginning, is you won't have problem with rats. Maybe in the very beginning you might, because the worms aren't populated enough, but once the population is up, Okay, I'll just give you a quick scenario. A rodent goes into the bin, right? Everything in that bin says, get out of here to the rodent. Predator uh, might start jumping on his neck and biting it. Uh, bugs start crawling around on its arm and into its nose and eyes and telling it to leave. So that, that thing's out of there. It doesn't want to deal with all that kind of chaos, you know? But over time, maybe, hey, I've gone and hit that bin like 10 times, like I, I think I know how to get to the food now, and they talk, and they figure it out, and they found a way in, da 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 da, da. Long story short, you can put a, a screen just right over the top, or 
resting down against the castings, or, you know, either on the top or down below. You can put a, a, a rat screen, so it, it could go underneath your your top, you know, and just kind of rest right there. Or you could sink it down here and have it rest right there, and that'll keep rodents out. Super simple. It it is an issue in Hawaii, but when your when your bin is firing and you got your food ratios properly, those rats won't bother it. If it's maybe just starting and you put a huge load of food in there and the thing's not balanced, they might come in there, you know? So just something to, something to keep in mind as well. Just wanted to show you some other, uh, I just browsed the internet real quick just to show you some other setups. When I first got into worm farming, has a young lad. No. <laughs> this, this was, I thought, like, that I went and I did this method and it works and everything, but it's just like so small and like you're just throwing a couple banana peels and throwing most of your compost into a compost pile. And it's just, it's cool to like learn the technique and you can get a lot of castings and if you don't have a farm, you just got some house plants and stuff, that's plenty, you know? But if you got a farm, you're gonna wanna step it up to a larger scale situation. And um, I'll go over a couple of these other setups right now before we get into compost teas and just draw you a couple pictures so you know what to do if you do end up going with one of these setups. Because it's slightly different than the rock method that I just showed you. You can do the rock method, and uh, but all these ones that I'm showing you don't, don't, aren't utilizing the rock method. They're utilizing what's called a double stack method. So I'll give you an example with a five gallon bucket. And so both, both of these methods, even if you used this bin, you're gonna use, you're, it's going to go inside of another bin. And I'll show you that just right now. So you could use the bin or a five gallon bucket or like how they got a, they got like a double layered um, cool looking wood thing which that drawer can pull right out and there's all your castings because they have a screen. There's like a screen here or holes in the bottom of a bucket, right? And then inside here, you got something to stabilize this to hold the bucket up, whether that's a rock or a two by four or whatever it is to create this separation. Same thing would go in like a Walmart bin and then like that, that blue bin I showed you and then another bin would be inside it. You could have a stone or a block here holding this up, creating this air gap. So that's the air gap, there's holes here the castings will drip and then you'll have to install a drain valve here of some sort, you know? Um, or just like a hole that you could, you could tip it because you're gonna want to, the fluid to get out of here. You don't want it to stagnate down here. So same thing, you just you put your bedding in here, you'd start putting your food scrap in here and put your worms in here and they would start working and you just keep stacking food and then uh, pull this off and you'd have juice under here or put a drain and let it drain. Here, here they got a screen. They got some bedding and a screen on the bottom of this layer. Food waste, that lid goes on top. The, the compost gets eaten, they keep replacing it. And the castings fall through the screen. The juice falls through the screen. They just open this up and pull out their castings. So there's several, I just wanted to show you, there's way, there's way more than one method, there's 50 methods, you know, um, but the principles remain the same, right? So and that, that's the key to this class, is understanding the principles. Um, Mykolo, you think you can grab that cooler right out there? Just, it's an empty cooler, there's this one thing inside of it. So... This is another uh, bin that I have at home. And you can see that screen and that cover. And um, this one uh, I, I posted on my Instagram the other day was, was uh, see those oyster mushrooms growing in there? So I had, you know those things you can buy from the, uh, like online and stuff, they got these blocks, they come pre-inoculated and you put holes in them and then the, moist, the mushrooms grow out. 
So after that thing wasn't producing anymore, I just chopped it all up and I threw it in my worm bin. And sure enough, I went back in a couple of days and there's blooms all over and it's probably just gonna keep going, you know? Because that environment in there is perfect for mushroom production. So you could even imagine like somebody that had a worm bin farm with a mushroom farm right on top of every bin. And you just got all those positive microbes interacting with the mushrooms, creating the most healthy, abundant mushrooms ever. So we need to take these principles and again, uh, become these, uh, these intelligent revolutionaries that are gonna bring new ideas to the world. Um, let's see. This is more of like a large scale style also. Same principles, right? And, and he actually uh, just lets, lets the castings end up falling through the screen and you just scoop them off the ground. There's those oyster mushrooms that were growing in the bin. That's, the, uh, that's that block of like sawdust that they come on that's just all chopped up in there. I even found some growing on these because they like, like a, they're in these uh, avocado peels because they're just become like carbon after a while. The, our avocados like don't the peels like don't break down it's so weird they're just like stay forever <laughs> it's like it's like a form of wood or something like that. it's like super interesting um, I want to to show you real quick this other setup if you guys can visualize with me I know my drawings are terrible but the guy that I learned to uh, to worm farm from he had a warehouse that was probably like a hundred by 40 foot warehouse and he just had all these bays of these, which were about six by, I would say, 10 foot, six foot by 10 foot. And so right now we're just looking at it from a side view. And basically what it was, was, um, these were like tabletop height, kind of like the worm bin I, I showed you. And um, this right here was a, there was a screen and then another screen that was, this could be moved about two feet in both directions, this screen. So he could come clamp this onto his tractor and pull this bar. And so this would come and clamp against here and it would, it would shave the castings and they'd fall. And then he could push the bar back and do it again. And the castings would just keep falling because as the worm eats, as it eats, it pushes down its, its uh, waste product to the bottom. So as it eats the fresh, it also pushes the waste product down. So uh, in, a, in a flow through system, they call these flow through systems, the castings can actually fall through this uh, porous mesh here. And so by him putting it on the tractor, he could pull this super heavy, this was all metal framed, all, all um, galvanized metal uh, piping that he had uh, welded together. So that now we're talking like major production. After this guy invented these bins, like people flew them all around the world to create them for them too because they were so productive and so easy to deal with. Because after he moved that with the tractor, he could come with a front loader and this was the right height. He could just scoop the castings back out, scoop the castings. So that's major production style and that's that worm bin, excuse me, the worm farm in Chico, California that I went and learned how to initially farm worms from. His name's Dave at a Soil Worm Factory, if you ever want to check him out. He's got some YouTube videos and stuff, really good teacher. I got a buddy that made a sifter. A sifter? A, a old coffee pulper. That would be, big, like, that would be so like sweet, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it just built like a half inch chicken wire mesh mm -hmm. box that he just pours his, pours his on That's it awesome. It I know uh, this guy in Maui too, who's the head of the farmers union over there, Vince. He uh, he made he took two cement or one cement mixer, and Jerry rigged like a bar coming off of it with a screen cylinder, and then he turns on the mixer and throws the uh, throws the castings into that cylinder, and it and then all of that falls down, and then all your bigger stuff and your worms stay inside that netting and then you dump that back in your worm bin. So we're not gonna get too deep into harvesting castings today, but I, I will briefly go over that right now actually. Especially for that, for this style bin that we talked about, um, that, I sh that I showed and set up here. 
So I'm just going to briefly tell you how, how easy it is to harvest your castings in this style bin because we're not, this is not a flow through bin. It, we're not collecting the castings that drop through. All of our castings are going to be on the bottom against our, uh, our, our separator, our weed mat. So what, what I'm going to do when I come in here and this has been active for like a year, six months or more, I'm going to then want to start harvesting my castings. You can harvest them as quick as a month if you want, if you want to start making teas or whatever, but I'm talking about bulk harvesting. And what I'll do is I'll just start feeding one side of the bin. So by putting my food scrap just on one side of the bin, most, 90% will migrate to this side of the bin. And when I feel that's successful, I'll just harvest this side. And, I'll, and of course I'll get some worms in there, some cocoons, maybe a little bit of rocks or something that might have been in that initial bedding. But I could screen that if I wanted them perfect. But for our, for our case, we don't need screened castings for anything, you know. We're just using them on our farm. We're not selling them or nothing. So um, that's a quick way to harvest this style, this more of the stagnant style bin. Any questions so far? So when you're harvesting like that, if you get some worms? Yeah, I just figure like it's all good because you're going to go throw them on your farm or something. I mean, of course, you don't want to bubble them in your tea and kill them, but... Right. You know. <laughs> Curious about the um, avocado skins. Like, how how long does it take to decompose? Like, I literally got skins in there that are like si over six months, like eight months old. You know, and they're still just starting to eat the edges of them. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they last a really long time. Yeah, yeah, they do get brittle though. Like, I can pick them up and just go, and they're just like real brittle kind of. Yeah, take a long time. Where did you get the red wigglers at? So the red wigglers, I do not believe that you can import them. So you got to get them from someone local that already has them. Fortunately, I brought 12. I bought 12 of these today. If anybody wants them, there, there's got to be at least a thousand in each one of these jars. But these are just ten dollars. If anybody wants a jar to start a worm bin, uh, don't take it if you if you if they're gonna die though. Bin, or you think you're gonna set one up, but you're busy and you're not going to. Do they? So, is there somewhere over there? Yeah, yeah. Nice. So you like on Craigslist and. Oh yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. It has to be someone local doing it. But yeah, I've seen on Craigslist. I've seen on bulletin boards. Yeah, yeah. And who I got them from was someone in Kona too, but a, a friend had called them. So I know at one point there was like a woman that was advertising selling them, and that's who I originally got yeah, them from. Oh, is that it? Yeah, loader. Oh, cool. Yeah. So there you go. Maybe Alex might even have a phone number for you too, if you want to hit him up after class. But um, we do have 12 jars of red wigglers here today for whoever wants to take some home. Um, I wanted to just show you before we finish types. I wanted to show you this. I kind of just got the vision of this, uh, thinking about the um, the bathtub style here. Because like, like essentially this is just a bathtub, you know? It has, a, it has a slanted bottom to it because it has to drain out here. So liter literally this is a worm bin waiting to happen, you know? It is a hundred dollar cooler, but... <laughs> but it would be a way, like if you love your shit like real clean and you don't want second hand stuff around your house, you just go buy a cooler and you could start your bin with that rock technique with the, with the method that we talked about in detail. And it comes with a lid, obviously. I'd, I'd probably want to remove this lid so it's not uh, sealing when I go to shut it. I'd probably put it on sideways or just slightly on there. And uh, this could be, I just wanted to show you guys this as a easy go-to worm bin that you could start today. You could just go buy a cooler or even use an old cooler that's out of commission or that might be you lost the plug or whatever, you know? has cracks in it. You just use that for a worm bin now and what I liked about it is that it is sloped slightly on the bottom towards the drain. The drain isn't all the way on the bottom so you may, when you harvest your juice, you may just have to give it a little tilt, harvest your juice, and you could use that rock method in there really easily with the weed mat. And uh, yeah, does that make sense to you guys? You understand those principles we went over and why this could be like a really easy, simple setup for somebody? Yeah. Yeah, you could do that too. That would be good. Then you could just seal it like that, and then just drill some holes. And that those could even be really small holes, you know. Great idea. Yeah, 
but it needs to be wider than tall. Tall. Yeah, so that's why, like, if you were to, like, say, if, as opposed to a five-gallon bucket method, I would, I would opt for something like this or a, or a, 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 a one of those totes, you know? Wider. Wider. Wider than tall. But the fi what's cool about the five-gallon bucket method, and I did want to show you, thanks for bringing that up, was, uh, like, say this is the earth or a garden bed right here. Oh, use the wrong pen. That's a Sharpie. <laughs> Four tries, get it. Okay, so uh, here, this is the soil. It's purple soil. Um, you got your five-gallon bucket of, of, uh, of worm that you started, and you, you did that method with the stack like we showed. Well, you could scratch that, and you could just stick these buckets right here in your garden. You could have one every 10 feet if you wanted. And you could have holes all through here. And then you could just start feeding worm scrap. You could inoculate these with red wigglers and then just start feeding the scrap right on top in your garden. So you don't even need a bin in your house. You don't need a special bin. You just got five gallon buckets sticking out of your soil. And you're just going with your food scrap in the morning and filling each bucket or whatever one needs it. And you got them on rotation. Of course, you might lose some red wigglers into the population, which is fine. But if they know that there's a dank food source in here, they're always coming back for it, you know? So you're going to get this exchange of uh, humic acids and worm juices just oozing into your garden bed without you going through all the steps of collecting it. So even an easier method. Yep. They even use uh, four inch pipes, like uh, PVC pipes with holes. You can just shove those into your soil and just start putting food scrap in them, inoculate them with red wigglers. Open and uh, you could do open bottom or just uh, drill holes like in the bottom of your five gallon bucket or just on the sides and leave would it you, sealed. Would you want to be thin enough so that worms can't try and get through it? Or it you could go with that too, you know. Um, it's, it's, at this point it's, it's an idea and it's an experiment so it's pretty awesome. Like you could do larger holes and see if they actually exchange and that you're getting them to leave and come back or if uh, smaller ho holes are more ideal for keeping them contained, you know? Totally. Yeah, that would be something cool to experiment with, but I wanted to show you guys those two methods as well. And not to beat the dead horse, but one more method that we're gonna do right outside, so I want you guys to see it real quick before we go do it. And um, this is, is a smart pot. You guys familiar with these? Yep. So m most cannabis farmers will know about smart pots, and what they are is they're fabric pots. They, uh, they, they let air in all around it. It's all made of fabric. So um, felt of some sort. So um, it's, it's, it's got the aeration going. You put the rocks in. We put our liner. We put our soil. We put our food scrap. Throw our worms in. We're going, you know? We're not collecting worm juice at this point, but we're doing castings on a large scale. This, you could eliminate the rocks and stick it on a crate, right? Because you got the air underneath circulating through it. So, so this could, you could put the soil right on the bottom of this bag as long as it's up on a crate to allow that airflow. You're gonna wanna put the screen on top and a cardboard cover or some kind of plastic cover, right? And it doesn't matter the size of the pot, yeah? Because I know you were saying for the farming, uh, the, the living soil has to at least be 100 gallons. Yeah, yeah, to keep that soil cycling yeah, and that yeah, living yeah. soil alive. This, you could do it in a, in a five gallon pot. It's just gonna run out of space real fast, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, all the way up to a, a, they have those big smart pots that are like four by eight feet long, you know, and you could just have that be a giant worm bin, you know? But um, that's another method and that's the demo we're gonna do after lunch. So, Smart pot method, cooler method, five gallon bucket method, totes from Costco method, bathtub method, uh, fancy, you know, construction method like these. You know, you, if you got a, a guy at home that loves to build and you can make drawers on it, you know, you could, you could go as, as deep or as simple as you want. You can go as pretty and cool or as rugged and, and natural, you know. Ever tried a washing machine? 
No. Uh -uh. I actually have a washing machine on the Really? You got it going right now? It stops spinning. So what I do is I actually, every time I need the warm juices, I just plug it in and, and I hit drain. What? And, and just let it drain out. Yeah. I add a little bit of water to actually <laughs> make that water go in. But it's already aerated. If you look at the, the washing machine. There's a holes in there. Holes in it and stuff that's like that. crazy. So that's all I do. And then it has a lid, so it's aerated already. See, so... That's that's what that's why that's why we want to keep those uh, those thoughts flowing, you know, and that's why being exposed to information like this will get the gears turning in your head, and and that's why I'm not trying to tell you. That's why the class wasn't called Worm Bin Bathtub Setup Class. We're talking about the basics and the principles, so you guys have the nitty gritty to then go apply it on your own, you know, and that's why you know. You know the information's real because it's not indoctrinating you into anything. It's just giving you the basics. And then you get it then manifest on your own. You know? Aaron. Do you know anything about the off gas angles? Like, is there a lot of CO2 that's released when, when the, uh, everything is composting down? I know in a, in a more of a compost situation, you're going to be dealing with a lot of that. Okay. And especially whether that's like a thermophilic hot compost or a cold compost, but in like a thermophilic compost, you're getting lots and lots of off-gassing, you know, CO2, methane. Yeah, the reason why I asked methane. Them, I like to grow like in tents and stuff, and like mm -hmm. CO2, if you can trap that in the tent, you can trap it's that. really good, so. I would, I would say the worm bin probably gives off some CO2, but a, but a composting thing would probably be a lot more. Yeah, and that's why today is not a composting class. We're talk it's a worm bin class and a compost tea class, so we're gonna get into that right about now any more qu oh i did want to show you one more one more method one more method just so we know we don't need to buy anything we don't need to buy anything and that's what that's the last message on this method this is this is a view from the side uh, this is a top view so from the side it's going to look like a mound of soil from the top, it'd be a large windrow of soil, right? So this is soil that's mounded. Okay, so this is that mound looking from the side. So we have this dank mound of compost right here. And it can be as long as you want, 10 feet, 20 feet, 4 feet. And our worms are living in here eating, right? And they have food to eat here, so they don't really want to escape. I'm going to come here with another layer of fresh compost or worm food. They're going to start migrating this way. I'm going to come here with more worm food. They're going to keep eating into the worm food. And they're going to keep moving this way as I put fresh material here. And remember I said you could feed them just straight compost? So that's kind of what you'd do in this method. And you'd just be feeding them this way so this lump would keep going out this way and then you would be harvesting from this backside. This is your finished castings. Fresh castings, they're leaving behind everything they already ate. They don't usually move until they eat most of it and if you feed it properly, you'll get 100% castings on this end. You guys understand what I'm saying there? This is the method that the worm farm up in Kohala uses. And uh, when Dragonfly Earth Medicine showed us that farm that they visited, I think a Blue Dragon Farm or something, they also use a similar method to this on a tabletop. So imagine right here, imagine this tabletop right here, having a, a, a weed mat right on a table. And then what they do is they put a row of food and they put the worms in it, really small, just like that, six inches wide, four inches high inoculated with red wigglers and then I put another row of food right along the side of it fresh compost they start eating this way put another row of food they keep eating now I can harvest these and I just keep feeding harvest the backside and you'll you'll see it you'll see when you put fresh compost compared to when it's done it looks different it looks like granule balls little casting balls so that's how uh, even they're doing production style like that in Kohala on, on a several of these tables. And you just keep it covered with a black plastic sheet. 
and they think that they're underground and they're just doing their thing in there, you peel that back and you harvest, whoosh, put another layer of food all the way down the table, then come back this way, come back that way, and you're just harvesting, you know. Make sense? I missed the part with the meat and the dairy. How come there's no, no meat and no dairy? So the meat and the dairy is going gonna, is gonna to bring about um, the soldier flies or the maggots to deal with it. The, uh, the red wigglers don't, aren't, and the microbes that are in a worm bin aren't going to deal with those substances. They're going to have to call in help in the form of other microorganisms, so you're saying, macroorganisms. When you're saying no meat and no dairy, uh, basically you're saying just to keep out other, other things from invading it? Yeah, it's not conducive to the balance we're looking for in a successful composting worm bin. Yeah. Um, if you were making a soldier fly bin, different story. You might want to use some of those things, you know. And, uh, and yeah. And also overfeeding will bring in the soldier flies too. But soldier flies aren't bad. They're good. Just remember that one too. Okay, now we're going to get into um, compo uh, um, compost tea. You guys ready for that? Okay, so I, I personally have explained the soil food web probably about six times up here already. So I found this video and I was like, man, I'll just have this video to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. Hopefully we get volume. What is the soil food web? To understand the soil food web, let's start with the term food web. We all know about the food chain, the animal kingdom on top of which are us humans, right? Well, if we look a little closer, we can see that some members of the food chain don't just eat one thing. That goes for humans, too. So the reality is more like a web than a chain. This is the food web. There happens to be a food web in the soil, too. This is the living part of the soil made up of insects, earthworms, and much smaller microscopic creatures such as fungi and bacteria. Dr. Elaine Ingham has pioneered research into the microorganisms in the soil over the last four decades and has worked with a team of research scientists to understand how they interact with each other and with plants. The soil food web can be thought of as the soil biome. Just as humans have a gut biome responsible for digesting our foods, so too the soil has a biome which breaks down organic matter and releases nutrients in plant available form. This is how nature has been feeding plants for billions of years. The major groups that make up the soil food web are bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. When in balance, these different groups interact with each other and with plants to create abundant ecosystems such as the great forests of the world. Have you ever wondered how forests can be the most productive ecosystems in the world without the need for any fertilizers or pesticides? The answer lies in soil biology. With a healthy biome, the soil can provide plants with all the nutrients they need, and with a number of other benefits, such as protection from pests and diseases, protection from drought and from flooding. The soil food web is, essentially, nature's operating system. Unfortunately, we humans have disturbed the soil food web in almost all of the soils that we manage, causing it to become unbalanced. As a result, the plants we grow struggle. Plowing is the major cause of the problem as it destroys the larger microorganisms, such as fungi and protozoa, leaving the soil food web out of balance. This results in a system breakdown. Nutrients are no longer made available to plants, and protection from diseases is compromised. Before the Industrial Revolution, humans would plow using oxen or a bull, which provided around 3 or 4 horsepower. Modern tractors can yield 400 horsepower or more. So far more damage is done to the soil biome by modern machinery. The use of chemicals has compounded the problem. The good news is that we can restore the soil food web to most soils within just a few months. This results in a number of benefits, both for farmers and for the environment. With a balanced soil food web in place, farmers need not use fertilizers at all. They don't need to use pesticides either, as nature's operating system protects plants from attack. Herbicides, used to kill weeds, are not required either, as weeds only thrive in conditions where the food web is out of balance. Restoring the soil food web means farmers save money on chemical inputs across the board. It also means that their yields increase dramatically. In some cases, farmers working with Dr. Elaine Ingham have seen yields increase by over 200%.
This is because the soil food web provides plants access to a constant flow of nutrients from soil organic matter and from the soil particles themselves. That's right, sand particles contain nutrients. And guess what? Fungi and bacteria can harvest those nutrients. They then make these available to the plant in a process that the plant actually controls. This means that plants get access to the type of nutrients they need precisely when they need them. That's how you maximize yields and optimize profits. For the environment, there is a whole host of benefits of having a balanced soil food web. Humanity is facing a number of existential threats. Let's take a look at how some of these are related to the soil. The most obvious one is soil erosion. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization has estimated that we only have around 60 years left before all the world's topsoil is depleted. Other estimates are as low as 30 years. The soil food web prevents soil erosion by both wind and water by building structure. Please watch the animation on soil structure for more information. Another existential threat we are facing is ecosystem collapse. The UN has recently stated that insect populations have been decimated by around 25% each decade for the last 30 years. That means that there are 57% less insects today than there were in 1989. Bird populations have declined by one third in the last 15 years in parts of Europe. So how does the soil food web help? Well, the UN has identified the use of pesticides as a major cause in the decline of insect populations. Please watch the animation on pests and diseases to find out how nature's operating system protects plants against the tech eliminating the need for pesticides. Another threat to life on Earth is climate change. Fortunately, the soil is capable of holding tremendous amounts of carbon in the bodies of microorganisms, and some mega-organisms too. The biggest living organism in the world is not a whale, it's a fungus found in Oregon that is the size of 1,665 football fields. It is between 2,000 and 8,000 years old, and it is made mostly of carbon. By restoring the soil food web, we could put a stop to climate change. Please watch the animation on soil carbon sequestration for more details. At the Soil Food Web School, we train people like you to help farmers transition away from using chemicals That's to farming in harmony. Is it's coming off the rest of us an advertisement for Elaine Ingham's courses. Um, if you do have time and money and really want to dive into soil food web on like a uh, on like a scientific level, this is a Dr. Elaine Ingham right here. She's known as the grandmother of compost, and uh, she really is in the West anyway, in the United States anyway, responsible for uh, this word, the soil food web, and for re-sparking the consciousness of the importance of all these little guys, all these microorganisms in the West. Um, I, I've studied Elaine Ingham. I've uh, listened to most of her YouTube videos that are available. She's a brilliant woman. She is uh, under the, uh, what do you call it, control or whatever. She works for the University of Oregon and so she does have some controllers and you can tell that too by studying her that you know it, I'm just saying you know whenever you study anything just have an open mind and, and realize sometimes people have agendas you know um, Elaine Ingham also uh, is now if you study her if you if you listen to her old stuff compared to her new stuff basically and you study it she at one point is introduced to Korean natural farming and then bad mouths it super bad. And then now she has re terminized some, re put new terminology on the Korean natural farming and now she teaches it. Okay. So, <laughs> you can't beat them, join them. 100%. And put your own terms on it so you make the money and not the Korean guy. <laughs> One time, she, one time she was asked at a lecture because she would go lecture in these highly cannabis zones that also study KNF, like Northern California. And one, a friend of mine asked her, have you heard of Korean natural farming? What do you think about it? She goes, oh, I don't know about old Asian guys rolling around rice balls in a bamboo patch. <laughs> and this is, that's, that's a paraphrased direct quote from her, you know? So... Anyway, I'm not here to talk bad about it. I'm trying, I'm trying to introduce you. She does have a beautiful website. She is offering all these uh, online classes now. 
like if you studied her five years ago, she was making all this available. Now you go to her website and it's all corporatized. Like she, it's all like a, something like Dr. Elaine, it's called. It's not Elaine Ingham or SoilFoodWeb.com. Now it's like Dr. Elaine, like a business or something. But she does have like really good microscope courses that you can take online on SoilFoodWeb.com, I believe. So any questions about the Soil Food Web? The reason why I brought that up was because the goal, number one goal of compost tea is to increase microbes on your land or in your farm or on your garden plot or in your greenhouse. Number two goal and also the number one is to increase the bioavailability of nutrients to those microorganisms and to your plants. That's the reason we're making compost tea and that's the reason why I introduced Dr. Elaine Ingham for those reasons because she is the grandmother of compost tea and she teaches a method called aerobic teas attributed to Elaine Ingham. We'll get into that in a second. On your part, if, if, I, if someone took that, that course, like on your part, would you prescribe the course? Yeah, I would definitely recommend the, run the course, especially if you're at all like a scientific or mathematic mind, like what is that, left brain or whatever. If, if you are from that kind of school of thought, you would love that course because like she teaches you how to, to take a sample out of your worm bin, mix it with some water, put it on a slide, and then analyze that slide and say, oh look, there's three pro protozoa per slide, there's uh, 20 fungi per slide, and there's 500 bacteria per slide. I got a dank ass compost, you know? Or you could go grab some forest hummus out of the out of the forest and, and do that same thing and look at it <laughs> and be like, whoa, that's, that's a crazy uh, set of microbes. I really wanna make a tea out of that and introduce that to my farm, you know? So it's really taking these principles that I feel are, are more intuitive and when you're doing with natural farming, you, like, a, like of course microscopes are cool, but like not a natural farmer out on the field doesn't have a microscope, you know what I mean? So he has to rely on other tools like smell, taste, uh, a feeling, vibration. And so I feel once we start diving into these instruments, those other skills get dormant in our bodies. You know, when we, when we use scales every time or measuring cups every time, of course do that for the first 10 or 20 times, but at some point you gotta rely on yourself, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's where, like, I'm not gonna invest my time into our microscope course because I could just go like this. Oh yeah, yeah, that's dank, you know? <laughs> that, well, that's why I'm asking you this question. You know? <laughs> well, that's why I'm asking you this question, like coming from, you know, these classes and stuff like that, you're already doing yourself for the smells, the looks, the other, using your other senses right. rather than tools the micro, that, right. you know. And that's my they, angle. They prohibit those, those senses, right? A hundred percent. You know, because like right now the internet is played, leveled the playing field with everything, you know what I mean? You can basically look. Look and look up anything. Google has a search, search engine, but, no. you know, you can basically find a lot of stuff about whatever you want. Hundred percent, right? You know, so. And then, and then, with a discerning, wise mind, you can navigate all that information, and actually be able to not get taken for a ride, but to go, oh, that's useless. Oh, that's valuable. You know. Yeah, yeah pick and choose. Right, right. Because there is so much out there, you know. So yeah, um, great, great insight. Um, yeah, that, yeah I, I personally prescribe to the human bio-instrument uh, and that, that we go over in the KNF class and the mind of a natural farmer class is the human bio-instrument. We're born with all these sensory organs, taste, smell, eyesight, feeling. You can tell the temperature of, a, of something by dipping your finger in it. It's amazing. We, we were given every instrument by our creator to do every single thing we need to do on this planet. Everything else is kind of noise, you know? But anyway, not to say, not taking anything away from anyone. If that's how you love to learn, and that's how your psyche and spirit learns, then you should do that. You know, you should go for it. There, there's an example of an aerated compost tea. Compost or worm castings are the number one ingredient for a compost tea. Why? Because they act as the inoculant. That's the reason why we're making the tea is to expand the microbes. So we're gonna, we're gonna introduce a handful of uh, castings, compost, or forest duff 
and then we're going to hopefully multiply those in our brew if we did it properly. We're going to multiply those and make them more prolific in our brew. In KNF, in KNF class, we get into IMO4, which is basically a tailored super compost to your land. So meaning that the microbes that we made in our compost, are uh, we grew them in, intentionally to be the peak microbes from the forest of our property. And uh, for a compost tea or what's called LIMO, L-I-M-O, liquid IMO, would be uh, the KNF method of an aerated compost tea. Yes, that's the indigenous microorganisms. Yeah, the IMO would then stand for indigenous microorganisms, so they would be tailored for your property and your farm. So I've heard like you could use like sugar and rice or something, you put it in like a uh, mm -hmm. container, mm -hmm. and then whatever grows on top of that would be what was naturally in the environment. Yeah, so what he's referring to are oh, these. Yeah. And that's during my K and F course. We would talk about this more in depth. How to catch, how to, how to store, how to catch, and how to cultivate. Yeah, cultivate. Yeah. And step I two, cultivate. step one, you're catching them from the undisturbed forest. Step two, you're preserving them. Step three and four, you're multiplying them and making super compost, as in IMO four. I use a moldy, or like I keep using lahala baskets, but. I keep like fucking up the uh, collection and they just keep molding out. So can I use that molded mahala basket or is it gonna like bring in all the bad microbes that I don't want? So um so he's asking he's he's doing these catches out in the woods and he's finding that he's getting a lot of uh, green molds and pink molds and whatnot. Is your basket actually breaking down or you're just saying that your catch like, itself um, I don't know if it's, I keep getting the collection because my basket, because like, I, the first one I did my, I just got a bunch of bacteria that I don't, I don't want, yeah? Right. And then it just, uh, I try to soak it in vinegar, but it, it just like started growing a bunch of mold on it. But. Yeah, so, so we would get into way more detail out of KNF class, and that's actually next week. We're doing KNF and cannabis class, if anybody wants to sign up for that. But basically, there's a few easy principles to follow with this to always ensure success. And the number one way people don't get their, you see this white cottony mycelium fungi growth, that's what we're trying to get. But a lot of times you can get green, black, pink, yellow, all these different color molds. And the number one reason is people usually don't hard cook the rice properly. And then rice has too much moisture in it. Mm -hmm. A secret to that, especially in Hawaii, that we have lots of moisture and, and warmth in our climate, is to put the rice after you hard cook it in the refrigerator overnight and then use it. You did that? Yeah, I, I'm, my question is just like, can I use the lahala mm. basket if it's all kind of like gross? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the basket itself, you just spray it out with the hose or wipe it down I'm, with the dish I'm soap. I'm doing that, but I can't, it's like stuck inside the fibers. Mm. Like I yeah. So I'm just wondering, does it really matter? Or is it? I mean, uh, if it's a if it's a mold that's that's affecting that catch, then yeah, I would just move on to a fresh basket. You know. Yeah. yeah. And then and then also. They, keep, they do uh, that. Make the cedar yeah. box. The cedar box is Master Cho's original method, but. La, that's the thing too. You don't want the treated lahala. Yeah, you got to make sure that anything that has like a, a shiny finish on it is going to affect the catch too, you know? I didn't even think yeah. about that. Yeah, you got to get the one without that shiny finish. But anyway, back to But IMO, the reason that we were talking about that is in Korean natural farming, you'd use the IMO in place of the compost or the castings. Supercharge it up. Supercharge High grade. <laughs> um, two types of compost tea we're going to talk about today. Um, number one, that's some strain and some compost tea. Number one is uh, aerobic, which we just saw that image of, aerobic. Number two, made famous kind of by Dragonfly Earth Medicine, is the anaerobic. And also, um, Michaelo, can you grab me that Jadam book right there? Should be right there. Um, also by Jadam, who is uh, Master Cho's son, and is also a very ancient human method, is the is the rotting method, the anaerobic method. And what these two words relate to is 
oxygen. So how I always remember, even though it's not spelled aerobic, it's pronounced aerobic. Air, has air in it. Air, bubbling, air. Anaerobic just shows me that it's not air, it's the rotten one. Anaerobic, aerobic, that's kind of how I remember. But anyway, right here, and I'll just show you some of these pictures real quick. <clears throat> if you can see these pictures, I'm not too sure. But um, what you're seeing is just rotting organic matter floating on water in buckets. This one says a natural cow foss. This one is uh, a natural uh, potassium fertilizer made with different plants that contain that, that uh, product. Like right here, he's showing you fermenting grapes, fermenting leftover tomatoes, fermenting leftover apples, fermenting leftover garlic. And you're just gonna let it sit in a bucket until it rots. And then that, re what it's doing is getting all those microbes in there and they're eating at that material, breaking it down. It's basically water composting, is how you could look at it. So I understand the difference between aerobic process and the anaerobic process <clears throat> as far as oxygen is concerned. And I understand that you're going to have way more ammonia coming off of the anaerobic process. Mm -hmm. That's why it's what you smell, it, right? Mm -hmm. the sulfurs and stuff. But which one is more beneficial? Right. We'll get, we're going to get into that. So, so. Elaine Ingham, who we just talked about, she swears by aerobic teas only. She's saying that all the beneficial microbes in the soil that are doing the powerhouse of the work are aerobic, so we want to multiply them in an aerobic tea. But Jadam comes in and he teaches, no, not just aerobic, we need diversity. We need anaerobic and aerobic teas, I mean uh, microbes. So diversity is key, but then you ask anybody that studies microbes, if you have too many anaerobic microbes, meaning the rotting ones, your farm is not looking good, you know? So, so yes, they are present, especially on the top layer of the soil. Anaerobic microbes are responsible for deep till. What, what I do know, because um, when I was, I used to um, um, grow soft corals and fish tanks. Mm -hmm. And I did employ some anaerobic bacteria mm -hmm. because they actually reduce the nitrates and the phosphates mm -hmm. inside of the water for mm -hmm. living for living. Uh, right, stuff. right. But when you're talking about wanting to, um, uh, when you're talking about plants or talking about teas, it would make more sense to have the aerobic kind because you want to have your nitrates and your phosphates. And there you go, there you go, and, that, and that's the gears turning, you know, with your life experience, you're applying the information that's being presented, very good, that's what we want to do. And um, let's, let's break this down a little bit further, because we get, during these processes, aerobic and anaerobic, we get different sets of microbes, right? So the set of microbes that come into your tea are going to determine the outcome of the tea. So, um, so what I mean by that is uh, the aerobic is going gonna, is gonna to propagate those certain set of microbes. The anaerobic is going to bring a different set of microbes. And that's where we get to dragonfly earth medicine and, and why they came up with this super crucial method through studying old world farming and new world technology is that they say we're going to let our tea sit like this for 24 to 72 hours, depending on your climate. The anaerobic and aerobic microbes are gonna work on that. Let me show you how. So there is a big debate that went on when Jadam came to the, to the West and he introduced his thing of, of letting stuff rot, all the soil food web Alang Ingham teachers got upset because we learned that it's aerobic we want. And now this guy's coming in telling us about anaerobic. His brew is an anaerobic brew. People argued in the natural farming world back and forth for months about this until the science came out. And what I'm trying to show you here is that even in a stagnant brew, 
the movement of the microorganisms creates a semi-aerobic environment. So you're still getting anaerobic dominance, but you're also getting aerobic movement in the brew without the aid of a bubbler. So they found this out after a while because they, 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 the Elaine Ingham's camp wanted to be so right, and then the, the Jadam Korean camp is saying like, no, 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 it's, it's all anaerobic, and that's what we're going for, diversity and breaking down the thing. Well, it came to find out both things were happening in that situation. So just to finish that thought off, DEM, Dragonfly Earth Medicine, will ferment for 48 to 72 hours. You're gonna start getting a little bit of anaerobic smell going on. Then you're gonna strain it and throw your bubbler in it. So that's the difference between Jadam, Elaine Ingham, and DEM. DEM is gonna marry the two. Let it anaerobically rot, then bubble it up with air. And now, we got, now we're gonna wait till it goes to that neutral smell again, which takes about 24 hours, and we're gonna then apply it. So why, why do you think you would want to let it sit anaerobic in a bucket full of plant matter, B-grade fruits, compost, etc.? Why would you do that? What's going on in that bucket? That's the breakdown of all the added material. Right. Right. But how, I mean, like, to me, in order to get that anaerobic um, uh, process going, you would have to have it sit for a while to, to kind of get all the air out of the, the water. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's a 48 to 72 hour to get to that peak that you're looking for. And what's going to and keep in mind, too, this is inoculated with worm castings and or compost. Wait, what's going to happen is this ends up, I don't know if I have a picture of it. No, but what will happen, it'll end up getting all these bubbles will start forming along here. And remember in the microbe class, whoever was here, we made um, potato wash water? There's the rings. That rings, right. And so the same thing will happen with that potato microbe water that we made. You'll get a bubble layer, and then it'll start separating from the edge. Now you know you're at your target for agricultural production. And do we know what the degassing is off of that, well, off of those bubbles? Are we talking about CO2? Or? You could, you could tell me, man. I don't know. <laughs> I just witness and uh, obey. It would be kind of just like the Korean not requiring food, but just adding that that uh, filter at the end or the bubbler at the end. Uh, the yeah, you know, exactly. The, like the grass food, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's a jawdam recipe right there in Drake's book is that's a Jadam JLF, Jadam liquid fertilizer. You just make it with grass. You take grass off your land, you stick it in a bucket, you let it rot. Remember when Dragonfly Earth Medicine was here? They talked about nettles. They're, it's the kelp of the land. It has all these trace minerals in it. So you cut down all your nettles or you go get kelp from the beach or you go get honu honu grass. You stick it in a bucket with water, throw in a handful of dirt or worm castings, 72 hours later, strain it, bubble it for 24 hours, apply it to your farm, spray it on your farm, soil drench it. And now what are we doing? We're increasing the microbes on our farm. We're increasing the bioavailability of the material that we, that we targeted to break down that contains nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and every micronutrient known to man because it's in the plant. Where, do, where does nitrogen go? Where does phosphorus go? Say a, a banana plant sucks up phosphorus into its body. The, the, so the phosphorus is a molecule, right? Say this is my fist, it's phosphorus. The plant sucks it up into its body. Where, where is it? It's in its body, right? Right. It's being used. Does it leave its body? Does it disappear? Does it all of a sudden be gone? Or is that phosphorus molecule still in existence. It's still in existence. So what happens when we chop that plant down and stick it in a bucket? We, yep, and then we get the phosphorus in our bucket. Or if we let it chop and drop onto the ground, it goes into the ground. So as a plant grows, and that's why they always say, oh, you gotta re-amend your soil. You gotta keep feeding your soil because your plant used it all. Well, they also taught you to take all that leaf duff and throw it in a pile over there instead of chopping it back on your soil or making compost that you reapply to your soil to never lose that nutrient cycle. 
So if your cannabis plant took up nitrogen and you chopped that back down, it just feeds the nitrogen back in the soil. If it took up nitrogen, now you remove it from the system, of course you're going to have to replace that nitrogen with something else. But if you just use the branches and the trees that you took out, chop them down, let them be compost, let them be mulch, you're returning everything that got sucked out into the plant right back to it. Same principle applies to this bucket. Anything we have put in there, if we put bananas in there, we're getting potassium. We're getting nitrogen. If we put uh, fresh growing tips of honu honu grass, we're getting the hormones of fresh growing tips of honu honu grass. If we put um, you know, any material high in phosphorus, then our tea is going to be high in phosphorus. Now that gets me into tailoring your tea. Now Dragonfly Earth Medicine also teaches, and this is also part of Natural Farming 101, vegetative for vegetative stage. Flowering for flower stage. And seeding for finishing, right? So do you understand what I mean by this? When you go to set up your tea, if you want it to be highly nitrogen and, and highly feeding your plants to be in a veg state, like as in a young state, you're going to make your tea with things that are vegging, things that are fresh growing shoots, nitrogen rich, uh, uh, green growing. So something flowering, you're going to go collect ginger flowers, blossoms from around your farm, um, things that are uh, uh, young fruits that are, uh, that are still unripe, unripe fruits, because they're going to send uh, signals to your plant of choice for it to start to flower. Oh, it's the hormones. I the hormones. The this five, this five hormones to the plants. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's... All, that, hormones that stimulate. Right, and so then if you want a finishing brew, you go for that, something that's seeding and starting to finalize and be on its last course of life because we're signaling our other plants with those plants. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know. That makes perfect sense. Nice. So, um, yeah, th this one, like, uh, they stir it every day. Every, once a day, they'll go with this paddle and stir that, that aerobic, anaerobic brew. So that brings me to, um, to uh, what, what are you going to add to your compost tea? So you got your bucket of water, right? You got your bucket of water. You got your bubbler in there, and we're talking about an, an aerated one. You got your sack of compost in there, or your worm castings. You could just call it cool with that, and just bubble that, and, and hope for the best. But usually you add a food source to it, in the form of a sugar or carbohydrate, right? So some people, like in the cannabis world, they just put molasses in there. It works, but not the best choice. That's where KNF comes into play once again, because we want to make a simple aerated compost tea. Well, not why not reach for an FPJ, you know, a fermented plant juice, brother Aaron. Just to add a caveat to what you were saying there, because that totally makes sense. Yeah, when yeah. You're talking about the five hormones, mm -hmm. basically that's what you're boring it. But I just wanted to add that if you take the tips yep. of your plants that are growing, like the tips of the, the mm -hmm. leaves or the tips of the, the plants. That's where you have the most concentrated of Hormone. oxen. Mm -hmm. And then if you add the oxen into your compost teas, mm -hmm. you're in your growing stage, you're going to get way more of that. 100%. And, and that's like in the Korean natural farming class, we teach to go out early in the morning and collect the tips yeah. of the plants to make your FPJ to capture those hormones. Yeah, the oxen. Yeah, and then in the morning too, the tips are more, more full of that growth hormone in the daytime, it goes into the roots. Yes, that's right. So that's why you want to collect them early in the morning. And I did an experiment by putting lights on the uh, roots in order to increase the oxen in there. Interesting. I had like crazy growth of the roots by having wow. lights light on the because the light soil surface the oxen in, in the roots. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So instead of uh, just regular old uh, molasses, we can reach for our FPJs, you know. We can, we can make a, uh, a concoction like a maintenance solution that we would just go ahead and spray in KNF, but we can pre-bubble it with uh, worm castings or IMO4 or compost tea and make it a, into a super uh, inoculant with all the benefits of our KNF. But that's the advanced. I got advanced teas here. 
And in advanced teas, you can also, in the, especially in the cannabis world, they, they've... First of all, let me warn you about studying compost teas because people got some crazy recipes out there, Espe <laughs> especially in the cannabis world. Like, throw fish emulsion, put five handfuls of this, put back guano, and they tell you the truth, they have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> they're just hoping for the best and throwing in things that might make sense to them, you know? But they are, there are advanced tea makers out there and really good ones and they've actually looked under the microscope after each batch and they've tailored to a bacterial dominant or a fungal dominant tea. And if you've come to take these classes before, we've talked about if the land is freshly bulldozed, the soil is highly bacterial. If your farm is freshly tilled, it's highly bacterial. An old growth forest or an old growth orchard is highly fungal. And that's what we're looking for is a fungal dominant soil because that's the healthiest soil for most plants. Now lettuces, brassicas, grasses, they don't mind bacterial soils. They love them actually. And that's why people can till in between harvesting lettuce because it doesn't matter that they're killing their fungal uh, networks. Aaron? Well, you know, another thing to add with that was what I was sharing to you before was the algae. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I was developing when my research got interrupted right um, but um, I definitely want to share with you some of the stuff that I, I researched from that yes I yes I will talk for sure man um, yeah so so you can tailor your tea to be fungal dominant to, to help create that fungal diversity and uh, we're not gonna really go into that but you can you can uh, study up on that and again number five avoid cannabis forums <laughs> they'll tell you the craziest stuff or you'll go into a cannabis shop and the guy's like yo man I got this it's been bubbling for 48 hours you need some of this and you're like smell it you're like holy fuck what are you trying to give me bro and uh, people just think they know what they're doing but they don't I was there before that's why I can attest to it and uh, simplicity is better a bunch of ingredients that are bubbled together is a nightmare waiting to happen. It might have bad effects, it might have great effects, but you don't know. So let's stick to the basics. Let's add a little bit of carbohydrate. Let's add some, uh, some things that make sense. Uh, if you got powdered humic acids, those are always good to throw in there, but your castings have plenty of that. You know, there's ingredients that make sense and there's ingredients that don't. Ingredients that don't are like heavy fertilizers, like bat guanos, uh, fish emulsions. Uh, things that are hydrolysate, but F FAA, great choice, great choice, right, right. So does that does that make sense to you guys? Like these heavy uh, industrial farmed products that are in bags, might not be the best thing to throw in your tea right away. Okay, you're a year into it and you're tailoring your teas and you know how they react to plants. You want a high phosphorus tea and you want to add high phosphorus bat guano and you know what you're doing, go for it. You know. Um, yeah, and just to finish up, basically, let's see. Hey, Michael or uh, Angelo, can you go tell my mom we're going to be done in about five, ten minutes? Yep. Um, okay, so yeah, those are the T's. Those are your, your super inoculants. Any other questions about, about T's? Are you guys understanding the... The basic concept of basically getting a bucket, sticking a, because uh, this, is, this is really, this is the T that we're going to focus on if you've never done it before, this aerated one. And, it, and this is like an example of a, uh, just a, a, an aerator. Uh, this is a, a pump, an air pump, and then this could look a hundred different ways. There are little tiny air stones, fish tank ones. As long as you're pumping bubbles of oxygen through your thing, and we're going to go over this after lunch. We're, we're going to set up a compost tea after lunch, and we're going to set up a worm bin after lunch. So the demos are going to come up right after lunch. Um, again, if you're just making this, you could do a simple worm casting tea with a little bit of FPJ or molasses, a little bit of castings, and just bubble away. You know, that could be your first experiment. Once you kind of get the hang of it, study up on these, uh, these um, stagnant ones and, uh, and start making those too. So basically, 
with, with just this information, you don't ever have to go to the grocery store again. <laughs> just with this info right here. Like literally, you could make, just with DEMTs, you could make your phosphorus rich brew, your nitrogen rich brew, your finishing formula, and uh, as long as you're treating your soil right, like we went over in past class of uh, living soil techniques, cover cropping, mulching, uh, adding layers of compost every once in a while, no more grow store. All that money is yours. Everything you gave to the grow store is just yours now. Your product grows up in quality, more money in your pocket. How would you recreate gypsum? Gypsum? Hmm, that's a good question. That's uh, a... Right? Yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a mined rock mineral, so... Uh, so you have, you have that, that probably, you know, one of the chips to farm garden or something like that. Yeah, yeah I mean, if you, if, if you had like a plant that needed gypsum per se, but then that, then again, you know, it's, calcium, right? you, it's a form of calcium, it's ca calcium something yeah, or other, you know? Uh, you could just use cross crawl, I'm thinking. Yeah, well, that's a that's the thing. Like each one of those types of calcium is like calcium bicarbonate, calcium uh, phosphate, calcium nitrate. You know, each one of those are a different form and are used in the soil food web differently. Gypsum, cannabis loves gypsum. You know, but it, but is it is it necessary to go buy that? No, not at all. But if you wanted to give it a quick dose of something, sure, you could go buy that. You know? So one of my setups, what I did is I harvested some. Uh, just corals that I got from the sea. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I did that is because even in an aerobic environment, as long as you have pores that are deep that you're gonna get inside of the, the corals, you're gonna have air in there. Anaerobic right. um, um, bacteria. Mm -hmm. And so like when you're talking about the teas, what makes sense to me is that you would want to use an aerobic tea when you're in the flower stage because your aerobic tea is gonna decrease the, the nitrogen and the phosphorus which you might not need as much when you're in the you're finishing. stage and you might, might right. want more potassium. So right. That makes sense. Right, so you can see Aaron's mind is turning. <laughs> <laughs> He's got it, so you can see the things <laughs> locking together, you know? Explosions, so good. Any other questions before we take a lunch break? No? Okay, so what we're going to do after this lunch break is we're going to come back and we're going to do some demos outside. We're going to do a large smart pot worm bin. We're going to hopefully have enough time to do a small cooler setup to show you that. We're going to make an aerobic compost tea and also hopefully a five gallon bucket of just a sample of an anaerobic compost tea. So my mom's deli is next door. She should have some specials or something, but um, there's also some snacks over here. And uh, yeah, we're going to take about 30 to 45 minutes. Sweet. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, good to you? see you. Yeah, yeah doing good. Love up. And what we're going to do is a uh, on the ground in a smart pot worm bin. The easiest, for, for a bigger surface area, one of the easiest methods you can do. So that's why I wanted to do that. My mom's going to be putting a, probably about one of these per week in there. Is what, is what the goal is, is about one of these per week to be eaten and to be mitigated and then eventually to have uh, worm bins going around the back of the building and all over so all of her compost can be turned to, uh, to worm castings and then we can distribute them to the community and also use them out here. <laughs> you can look, uh, look over here at the garden we planted two weeks ago. Yeah, we're just, we're just talking about that. yeah, yeah. So that's that's had no sprays, nothing, no fertilizers, nothing added. That's just the living soil method that we went over in class, um, and it's starting to thrive. And and you can start seeing what plants love it and what plants don't. All those plants seem to be loving it. The rain's been a little bit of an issue with some of the greens, but besides that, it's going off. Um, so what we're gonna do now is, is make this worm bin and we're gonna make it right on the side of the building over here. I am gonna need some of the boys and girls, whoever wants to help out. Um, we're gonna carry these two buckets back there of rocks. This is a really heavy bucket of uh, soil right here. So maybe two brothers or uh, whoever's feeling strong can grab that. And, um, and uh, I'll bring this compost up there. We also need that weed mat. So someone can grab the weed mat under there and we can head up here.
Yeah, I just kind of made this flat last night. <clears throat> this is uh, what I was referring to as a uh, smart pot. That's just the brand name. There's several companies that make these and what they are is just a porous pot. And so that takes care of our uh, airflow situation like we talked about. Remember uh, the principles that we need to follow. Um, we don't necessarily need the cooler. You can just stash it right up there, but just that. You can start un unraveling that too, somebody as we talk if you want to. But we're gonna use that at the end, it's not a big deal. <clears throat> what we're gonna do first though is go ahead and, uh, remember we talked about in class is the rocks go on the bottom. So we'll bring those two bucket of rocks over and hopefully that's enough to cover the bottom of this bag. Um, they got these at like any grow store online, anything like that. And this is like a, this is an old one that you know I used to use it for plants and stuff. Remember we had the food farming in Hawaii 101 class. Uh, I was showed that you could just make a garden right in these little things, and that's what I got at my house. Is a lot of these just in my yard, like old ones that I had laying around, and I repurposed them for for a garden. And look, that's perfect amount to cover the bottom and remember the bottom we're just looking to create that air layer and drainage layer and so next what we're going to do is grab that weed mat and we're going to cut the scissors let's go see what i did with those scissors all oh, right there okay um no not at ace hardware you're going to want to go to farm and garden for this stuff either order it online or get it at farm and garden and what I'm gonna do is just cut a piece to line the bottom of this bag with. So, just like that big. And remember I said too, with this method, you could just stick it on top of a crate and you wouldn't have to, uh, have to do the rocks. And this method too, you're not doing it to collect the worm juice either. That's just gonna kind of stay in your castings or, or get leached through the bottom of this bag, which is not a big deal. And so now we're just gonna line the inside of this bag and that's gonna keep our worm population out of that rock layer and keep that air layer in there how we want it. Because we need the air from the bottom, it's pretty key. Next, we can dump that soil in here. Um, might want to maybe grab the five gallon bucket and take a few buckets out first. Is that a good idea? So ideally I wouldn't be using this. It just, uh, I started sifting a bunch of compost this morning and that's what I would have used ideally is just straight compost without these cinders in it. This is more of like that, remember when I told you to get the organic matters one third mix? That's basically what this is right here. So I'm gonna get enough of that in here to hold this bag up at least. Okay, we could probably just dump, dump it on now. And you don't need this much, but I just wanted to, wanna hold this bag up at least just so you can see what it, the final thing will look like. And uh, back to what I was saying is ideally, uh, this would just be some fresh compost, not this one third mix with the cinder in it. But it'll be great for the bottom. It'll be good for drainage and the worms won't mind it. You peat moss could be another alternative? Peat moss, uh, s soaked paper. Just straight up peat moss? Yeah, just straight up peat moss. Not with the, uh, not the pro mix, but just the peat moss. Okay, so what I'm gonna do just to can you help me fold these over just so it's not flopping all in there and stuff it looks a little more clean I'll put this around the edge yep sweet okay now if somebody wants to uh, grab a jar of those worms that are down there that was one don't forget the worms, whatever you guys do. It's 
So, rocks on the bottom, weed mat to separate, bedding. Again, this cinder stuff, not the most ideal bedding, but it'll do. Right here, we're looking at that like 90% to 100% moisture in there with that runoff. So, won't have to water this for a while. It'll be fine. And the reason why it's so wet is that was in the back of my truck getting rained on this. And that's why it's so heavy too. <laughs> yeah. This thing was so heavy, yeah. Okay, go ahead and throw the worms in. Send them. Yep. Not the avocado shell up. Yeah, I mean, we can get one more of those unless, uh, unless ever, is more people want to buy some or take some home. Maybe grab one more of those jars. Well, that's all that was in there. Doesn't look like a thousand. No. <laughs> doesn't. Approximately. Approximately, uh, <laughs> 200, 100. Yeah, give it three months. They'll... Oh yeah, yeah, that's the thing. They're gonna multiply, but we'll go ahead and throw one more jar in here. Are you talking about the native worms? Like, can you give any advice on identification? Like, you know, if you have, like, you have big, fat, nice-looking earthworms that I don't like. Are they probably not red wigglers? Yeah. So the, the red wigglers are, in particular, um, are the species that we're looking for. They're red. They're much more um, segmented. Um, there are there, there are a, a red worm. There is a red worm that that also does a lot of composting. That's not necessarily the composting red wiggler that you find a lot. And we were just talking about that earlier. But um, yeah, the composting worm itself is going to be the red wiggler, and that's what you want for this worm bin situation. The, if you do find a red worm on your property that has the same characteristics as these guys, you could go ahead and try those out in a worm bed and it should be successful as well. Do they compete at all or eat each other? Not necessarily, no. Like, um, I know there's like a lot of indoor facilities that are like cultivating like uh, medicinal cannabis and stuff. And what they'll do is they'll introduce like a, a, a night crawler or like an earthworm to be the bottom subterranean tiller and then they'll introduce red wigglers as their top layer and they live symbiotically together. And also the red wigglers, if they do get out into your farm, because I'll, I'll notice these all over my farm and, and I'm still not 100% if they just came because I've had bins on my farm that have inoculated my farm or if they're another species I'm, I'm yet to determine. And so that's that. and. Um, the last step would just be to put a layer of food in the form of, and then it, you can get as, start with not too much food, but this, this looks about perfect for that amount of worms. And like uh, someone said, like, yeah, that was more like two, 300 worms per jar, but they're gonna be a thousand, 3,000, 4,000 in a matter of months. How old do they have to be to like reproduce? Um, so you'll notice that the worms we threw in here, there's all different sizes. And um, I'm not sure exactly what age they start reproducing, but I do know they live up to two to three years. So, so they, they do last a while. It is within a couple of months they'll start uh, reproducing. And yeah, the population will triple every three months or so. And um, <clears throat> what you'll notice too, when you go to put your compost down, if you have it like that, that's when you're going to get the soldier flies. When, when, the, when the worms and the microbes don't got enough air. So, so you, want it, you want it a thin layer, like on the top of your soil. You'll end up, if the, the stickers and stuff, you'll notice that if they're like plastic, you'll just find them in your castings. You could either remove them, it does not a big deal either. But uh, yeah, flat against the surface. And then um, there's a some cardboard down there, a big cardboard, if maybe uh, it's right on top of that whole setup over there. Now right around the corner is a big sheet of cardboard. Yeah. And what we'll do is, uh, we got that screen. Yeah, he's on screen, man. It's getting there. Anyway, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, do that. I'll do that after, but I just wanted to show you that basically what I'm going to do after is I'm going to screen this. And uh, depending on the vibe, I might go over the top or I might go inside. And that's just in case there are rats around here. 
Um, if, if you already had this firing, you'll notice rats aren't attracted to it, you know, if it was already going off, you know. No worries on the screen, brother, I'll get it later. And then also what I'd do later too is make just maybe one of these panels and uh, finish this off just by putting a piece of cardboard and, and later I'll cut this to size, but it's just gonna get covered with a piece of cardboard after. So just so you guys know what the finished product is gonna be, is gonna be screened and cardboarded. And uh, that's it. These worms are gonna start eating and you'll be amazed that even if I come out here tomorrow and lift this off and I lift up some of this watermelon or I lift up one of these asparagus, you'll see worms starting to gather underneath. And again, they're not eating the organic matter. They're eating the microbes that are eating the organic matter. Cool, any questions about that? Can you touch real quick just on the slug issue and slugs? I've, I've found uh, slugs aren't super attracted to it. Those big uh, horned snail looking things that are new to the island. I do see those kind of come around the edges and because they're... Slug that has the little... Not that guy, but you know that big uh, like brown one. shelled... Yeah, brown white. yeah, the one I just pulled out, exactly. <laughs> bro, those things are crazy, bro. And I used to throw them in my woods, but now I take like a salt solution. Yeah, yeah, just throw them in the bucket. You can make FPJ out, or uh, FAA out of them yeah. too, SAA. Out of the um, this, You can just collect those snails like at night if they're all over, or if, uh, and you collect them and just ferment them in sugar. And then the liquid you can use as a uh, as a fertilizer. Yeah, so you're util Yeah, with the shells on there and everything. And then if you want to make the calcium more available, you'd actually crush them up before you put the sugar on, because it would help break down the shell. But that's a whole nother uh, recipe. It'd be like a natural farming recipe. The mole toast. Yeah. Well, um, the the mole. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, there there's the rat lungworm, which is an issue. But but here's my thing: is like, is like only nature out of balance is is gonna have something in it that's harmful to you, you know. And it's only harmful to you because it's trying to do something in nature that that takes a really aggressive microbe, you know. And when that introduced to our, our biome, it's, it's all out of balance and stuff. But it was only in that environment because something was so out of balance that it was a harmful, quote unquote, microbe for that situation. It had to clean up some toxin or something, you know? So it's like this other type of microbe that might not be so friendly to us. But what I'm trying to say is, is once your farm is clean, once your farm, and what I mean by clean is back to that sterility of positive microbes, not, not void of microbes, but just having the positive ones present, then you don't have to fear anything about nature. There is no rat, rat lungworm because that's not invited into your garden. And just like here, there, there won't be rats in here once this thing's firing on a proper level because it's not invited to the party, you know? Something that requires a rat invites the rat but this doesn't require the rat so it won't come you know and so it's just like uh, master cho has a quote you want maggots then make an environment for maggots it's that simple you want positive uh red wiggler environment make an environment positive for red wigglers you know and um the only thing we may see here is that it's too much food and we might get a a, a soldier fly or two or maybe even a maggot if there is way too much food but um those maggots will be decomposed by more other positive microbes and the cycle of life continues. And the lid will also help keep these flies out, so that's not an issue either. So yeah, any other questions? You just pause the feeding if you get the soldier fly overload. Yep, just pause the feeding. Yep, if you get the soldier fly overload, you can just pause the feeding and uh, let it finish it off. Um, like I said, if you, if you really want to be on top of your game, the best thing to do is to grind the food down first. As, as far as best practice because it's going to disappear that much faster and that much less for some kind of imbalance or, or microbe you don't want in there. But, uh, but once this is going with the worm population, it's not an issue really at all. Um, what thing's cool about these is uh, like when I, at one point I had a soil company. I've told you guys that a few times, but I used to make these uh, and I call them worm bombs. And then when they got to the top, I'd sell them for like $500 a bag. And so you could just, 
you know, that's like a hundred gallons of worm castings right there or compost with worm castings, a mixture thereof, but it's just full of life. So you throw that into one of your garden beds, you're taken care of with your microbes, with your humus, you know, humic acid, with your organic matter at all at one time, you know? So, so these are easy to, what I'm trying to say is how to harvest these is you'd, you'd let it finish off and then just scoop it right on out onto your farm. If you wanted to get the worms, there's methods to get the worms. You could put a gunny sack on top and put the food on top of the gunny sack. And once you get most of the population up into the food layer, you remove the gunny sack. And now you just have the castings. You could feed one side of the bin. When most of the worms move to one side, then you start scooping from that side if you wanna keep your worms intact. Another method is to just harvest the whole thing, re-inoculate a new one from your, uh, from your compost worm bin that you have somewhere else, and just start a new one. And then again, that's gonna be your ingredient, your main ingredient for the compost tea, which we're gonna make next. Sweet. So, if, if you're using a bathtub mm -hmm. for this, and you have it covered, mm -hmm. you just have the one drain there, mm -hmm. how are you getting the airflow? Is it, is it really getting that, like, enough airflow? Yeah, it is. So you're gonna have a loose lid on it, and then you're also gonna have those rocks underneath. So, so you're, you're, uh, your body of, of castings and compost isn't smashed against the bottom. Therefore, you ha you're always having air moving upwards. The worms are tilling all the time. So they're moving air and opening pockets up. The microbes are moving up and down, causing aerobic activity too. Okay, cool. yep. More about not making a puddle. A puddle is, is yeah. Airflow. It's not like airflow, it's just not yeah, having it. Yeah, it's act, not like, stagnant. Cool, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, just having that drain is the airflow, Sweet. pretty much. Yeah, and it has the top too. Yep, yep. Part. And then the top isn't sealed, and that was pretty, as a key also, not to just have a sealed top, you know, because you want that perspiration to come out the top. Would this location be okay as far as sun and heat? Yeah, because uh, it's really going to be shade most of the day from this. It's probably only going to get about an hour or two of sunlight before this shades it and that shades it. Plus, it's going to be, the worm's going to think it's nighttime 24 hours a day with this on top of it. So it's always going to be working. And that was one thing, uh, like the worm farm in Chico that I learned most of my worm farming from. They actually were in a warehouse, so they would have to put a light and they didn't have covers on theirs, they would put a light, it would come on at night because they didn't want the worms to escape. So that makes them burrow down. So right now when the sun's out, they're going into the middle and they're kind of hanging out where their favorite zone is until it's time to, the, the conditions are right to start feeding more from the top. And remember they eat and then they push the castings downward. So the castings will always be on a layer at the very bottom. Good stuff, good stuff. Any more questions? No? Okay, let's go ahead and move to the front of the building. Do the natural farming uh, Instagram or shoot me a text or whatever's cool. Pretty easy. Yeah, the Instagram is Institute of Natural Farming. Same as the channel for the YouTube. So if you're not following or subscribing, that would be cool if you could. Just makes the, the algorithm picks up the more followers you got, so helps out. Sweet, and then uh, my colo, if you could un unroll the uh, hose and bring it over here and go ahead and turn it on. That's my brother, yeah, plug that brother, that in. Um, I'm gonna pull aerated compost tea and I'm gonna, I'm gonna inoculate it with some KNF uh, enhancements. So, Bob, if you can grab that Ace Hardware bag right there. Yep, and then that white bucket next to it as well. So normally you would use like, a, they got these things called compost bags, cheesecloth, t-shirts, socks, anything porous material. This happens to be an old uh, hash bag that has porous material on the bottom. So I'm just using this. Um, they do sell them, they're called compost tea bags or uh, compost tea socks that are specially made for it. And you're just trying to go for a small micron. You don't want a big uh, screen or anything like that. Watch those plants there. And we can just start filling this bad boy up.
I'm gonna let some of that hose water, let this like plasticky smelling hose water out first. But anyway, so you got your inoculant. This can be compost, IMO4, worm castings, or all three of those. Um, it could be forest duff from an old, old growth forest, right? Just go collect some earth from the forest. And that, that's the part of, uh, remember we talked about Elaine Ingham and kind of talking about Master Cho and k &F a little bit. Well now she teaches, go out in the forest and grab handfuls and make your teas with some of that, you know? So she's taking her method and part of Master Cho's and kind of incorporating them together, you know? So <clears throat> once this fills up with water, I'm gonna let this kind of massage it into the water a little bit and then, I, then usually you can just hang your bag from the side. Some people put a stick across to hang their bag in it, but you kind of want your, uh, your inoculant suspended in there. And just to make it a, a, a nicer tea and just a more active tea, I'm gonna reach for a carbohydrate source. And um, th in this, this case, it'll be a, since I got this one labeled, it's a banana flower and fruit FPJ. Oh, it's probably gonna explode on me if I get it open. No, not bad, not bad. Yeah, it's still really nice. So uh, sometimes when you seal your FPJ, it can get alcoholic, but this one's really nice still. And um, since we're doing a 30 gallon, there's about a 33 gallon jug here, um, I'm gonna weigh that, I'm gonna measure this out according to Master Cho's prescription. Because uh, there's no reason to put more on, right? Because then you're just a moron, right? <laughs> <laughs> I got that one from Drake, by the way. No, I'm not my, it's not mine. But uh, yeah, you just stick to the stick to the uh, to the uh, ratios stated by the master, and which is four milliliters per gallon. Four times thirty is one twenty. 120. So we're gonna put 120 mils. 30, 60, 90, 120. So that's our carbohydrate source, but not only that, we got all those plant essences, hormones, potassium, all those micronutrients from that FPJ, um, which we're gonna go over in a KNF class, but a substitute for that is uh, simple sugars, Brown sugar, molasses is mainly used in the different industries, but uh, I, I don't really recommend doing that per se. Um, I'm gonna reach for a little bit of uh, extra minerals in the form of sea salt. Um, this is a product called C90, but you could just use ocean water. Even better to have local ocean water. This is uh, from uh, the super mineral dense sea in, uh, in Europe. So I'm just gonna add a, a handful of uh, sea minerals. And that's just gonna help boost the minerals in my tea. Now, if I wanted to make this a, uh, tailor it to be like a nitrogen rich tea, then I'd reach for a nitrogen uh, rich fertilizer, something like an FAA, fish amino acid. Um, I'm gonna use this tea to, to, plant, to hit all these vegetables, which are nitrogen loving and bacterial loving vegetables. So we'll go ahead and, uh, and just add maybe like a half a dose. So instead of four milliliters, I'll do two milliliters per gallon just cause I'm not trying to like over nitrogen the situation. Hawaii in general already has a lot of nitrogen in the air. Um, tropical weather has nitrogen that's, that's fixated out of the air and in the rain. So we don't need all that much. I'm just gonna go ahead and add 30 milliliters. So what I'm trying to show you is this isn't like a, a recipe that's like written down anywhere or nothing like that. I'm just trying to be kind of conscious of what's going on in my garden and intuitive of what the tea that I'm focusing in it for. So um, I got the, the powers of banana flowers, you know, and, uh, and I got the power of the fish aminos and also all the minerals from the ocean in this, minerals from the ocean in that. Um, I know that, uh, that vinegar helps break down even further, micronizes my uh, ingredients in here. 
and also helps make all the uh, organic matter more readily available to the microbes. So I'm going to go ahead and add my, uh, my banana vinegar in there too. And Master Cho's prescription on that would be uh, eight milliliters per gallon. And just because I have it here, this is some OHN, uh, which is the uh, KNF uh, medicine, the herbal medicine. And uh, that's back down to the four milliliters per gallon. Tinctured, tinctured, uh, fermented and tinctured. Forty percent alcohol. Forty percent, eighty proof at least. Yep. And we need. And next Saturday is a KNF intro class. We're gonna go over all these inputs in detail, but we're not gonna make all of them like I would do in a actual KNF instruction course which would take at least two days. We're going to go over the intro of all of these and then how to apply them to a cannabis patch, farm, pot, living soil bed in particular. And then we're going to also show you how to replace one for one bottled nutrients that you might buy for the store with your KNF ingredients. So that's next week. But anyway, that's, that's a really good uh, situation there. That's basically my maintenance solution. I could add uh, phosphorus if I wanted to help with root production or with, uh, with uh, flower and fruiting production. I could add uh, some potassium or calcium to help with, uh, with fruit, again, fruiting production and uh, ripening and hardening of the skins. But I'm not gonna do that right now. This is gonna be a nitrogen rich tea, microbial rich tea for this garden right here in particular. So after this fills up, it's pretty full now. It's got all my KNF newts. I'm just gonna massage this in a little bit. And you don't even really have to do that as long as that bag's in there. And then I'm gonna get my bubbler set up. And again, these look like all different ways. It's simple as a, a fish tank bubbler to uh, these bigger motors. They got all kinds of these on the market. You could just uh, type into your computer uh, uh, compost tea pump or fish pump, fish tank pump. They got this really cool one that fits in a five gallon bucket where the there's like a coil and you can just push it down and that the coil bubbles up and there's a handle to take it in and out. That one's really cool. You can hear it come on just pushing air and usually like what I'll need to do is put a rock on top of this and track me down on big rock but yeah and then uh, if you guys want to come over after this is full and, and uh, get this weighted down you can see it just bubbling away and that's that's gonna be what you want it to do might need a bigger one let me see Yeah, I need a bigger one. So yeah, this thing does have these stickies on it, but the bottom of this is kind of lumpy, so it doesn't stick, but yeah, that one will work. So I'm just gonna weight it down with a rock. Sometimes you'll come over and you'll see these rocks that you put to weight this thing down. It'll have uh, all kind of uh, slime on the outside of it because of all those K and F nutrients we put in there and all our inoculant. Microbes like to mine minerals from rocks. So you'll see that this slime kind of grows on the outside of these rocks and that's actually the microbes mining the minerals off the rocks. Pretty cool thing to witness. But that's it right there. So you guys can come check it out if you want and just see that it's bubbling and doing its thing. What I'll do is I'll loosely put this lid on there 
and then I'll watch for microbial activity. And, and what, my, what I mean by that is that they'll, they'll start to get a foam on here. And uh, the microbial foam comes on its own and it'll come after about 24 hours. Sometimes people put, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, sticker spreaders, uh, like soap-like products or aloe vera or um, uh, yucca root extract and that'll cause a foam from the sugars and from the soaps. So don't get that confused with your microbial foam, the two different things. So what I'm looking for in this is to get some kind of a, a foam started on here and that'll usually happen about 24 hours. Don't you know feel disheartened or anything if you don't see a foam. There's still activity going on in there. There's still life being cultivated in there, but really the, we're going for a 24 to 36 hour brew. <clears throat> People have done microscope work up and down on these things and, and that's the sweet spot. Earlier, you're gonna get a different set of microbes. Later, you're gonna get a collapse of your beneficials and they start a brewing of just what's called ciliates. It's kind of these larger microbes that ate all your beneficials and now they're dominating the brew that they start coming in at about 48 hours. Um, this is all just, you know, gu guesstimation number, not guesstimation, but, you know, ballpark numbers. So yeah, and then your climate's gonna depend. Like if you're in Arizona, you're in uh, winter in California, like all these brew times are different. But here in Hawaii, that it's faster. So 24 hours, it's about a good window. 36, about ideal. Any questions on the compost tea? Does everyone understand why we're making worm bins and why we're making compost tea? Yeah? Uh, what do you do with the, the stuff that's in the bag when it's pow? So the stuff in the bag when it's pow, I like to um, just put on top of my soil beds and cast it like that or throw it into a compost b uh, pile, either way. Yeah. Anything else? So um, that's pretty much it. The one other thing I wanted to show you was just a, a stagnant uh, brew, which would just be filling this up with water, throwing some compost in there, collecting some leaf litter and some leaves from the garden, and letting that sit stagnant for about 72 hours. And then you would strain that, bubble it up. And on that, what you're doing is releasing all the nutrients from those plants and then bubbling them in here to give that aerobic microbe a chance to take over after it, the anaerobic microbes unlock the nutrients for you. So that, that's that stagnant one we talked about in the DEM, Dragonfly Earth Medicine Tea. I'm not gonna show you, but you guys understand the, the gist of it. And again- um, They're also diluting it up, right? So you're getting a bigger amount. Yeah, you're, so- you're starting that and then double. Great point, Alex, because even this can be at least, could, you could, do this one to two with fresh water after it's done, easy. Could even go up to one to 10 if you were doing acreage, just to spread those microbes around. So this 30 gallon could feed 300 gallons of water and then you could spread it around acreage. But since you're only, only doing it here, I'm gonna use it 100% because there's nothing uh, that it can do harmful, even at full strength, you know? So uh, good point. Because yeah, those, those stagnant brews, are even recommended probably to dilute a little bit at least, you know. Cool, any other questions? So for this one, you're not letting it all sit before you put the bubbler in, you just... This would be the, which, which would be like the, called the aerated compost tea. Immediately. Immediately so aerated. For 24, 48 before you add the bubble. Yep, even 78, uh, 72 hours even, until you got a good bubble activity on top of your organic matter, you'll see those bubbles and you'll, You'll smell it, it'll go from kind of sweet to start to sour a bit. And that's when you know you're right in that zone that you wanna strain it and bubble it. And that's how you're gonna get nutrients out of plants, where this time we took nutrients from our inputs and from our compost tea, I mean our, our compost inoculant, where this way we're gonna unlock the nutrients from the plants, then bubble them with our aerobic microbes, our beneficials. Make sense? Sweet. All right. You can do what? You can just use all of it. Yep. So I'd use I'd use uh, this at either full strength or diluted up to ten times, and you can use the whole thing. Um, if you let any of it sit, 
it might end up getting stinky after a while. Yeah, so you can so what you could do after this is uh stick it in a like a sprayer. This would be the smallest sprayer, but uh you know, they got backpack sprayers, they got 2 gallon pump sprayers, they got battery operated sprayers, they got electrical sprayers, but you're going to get it in a backpack or even a fogger if you could get one of those and just uh, inoculate this whole garden. And then I could also pull it out by the five gallon bucket or watering can and just water it into my soil. We want to do both of those things. And then that's a good question because when you spray it, you're going to want to spray it in the early evening or a really early morning to catch that um, microbial peak and not have them just spray in the sun and then fry off, you know? Yeah, so you don't want to be spraying microbial anything in the sun because you're just kind of wasting them at that point. I mean, it's going to be a benefit no matter what, but ideally early morning before the sun comes out or just when the sun is fading. Great question. Um, yeah, so that's how you apply it. Like uh, that cacao farm that, uh, that we switched to K&F, they have a, a cart and this is how I do it at my house too is I have a 25 gallon pump sprayer in the back that hooks to my gate, uh, Kubota battery with the clamp. So it's just, and then I pull my 50 foot hose out and just psh, drive to the next spot. Psh. And ideally you want to inoculate your whole farm, your whole property, your neighbor's property, the fence line, the highway line. You know, like Drake said, drive, drive with the sprayer out your car going down the highway. You know what I mean? like a crop dusting plane. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, see, that's the next level. You wanna, know, you wanna know how we do that? Is when we're in the crop duster. Us, conscious human beings that care about the earth. Right, right, so, so they already got the tools. Now it's just we need to be in the driver's seat instead of someone that's willing to kill us, you know? We're, we're gonna take the driver's seat. Us, conscious human beings that want the earth to flourish, we want our community to flourish, we want the cakey to flourish. We want to give them more than we had. We don't want to take so they don't have. That's the difference between us and them, you know? Bob Marley said, how are we and them going to work it out? And it's we. we. We are the people, the real ones. So put them in the driver's seat, you know? Uh, they stop incentivizing with, with, uh, with, with fiat money. And, uh, and let's, let's, uh, let's start giving um, some uh, a system that grows off of uh, health and abundance you know instead of uh, scarcity and and fiat currency you know so i think it's all come in you know and obviously signs of the times and you know we're living we're living in it we all know that this is this is it you know so uh yeah that's 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 the message we're here to live it we we're here right now 2020 not them we are 2020 so let's just take this knowledge, we'll bring it out there. What was your question? How often do you fill your spray? So <clears throat> Master Cho says every 10 days, every week to two weeks, you're gonna wanna keep inoculating your farm. Obviously, if you're really in focus and you got the time and you're doing it, just do it every seven days. You know, oh, Tuesday, that's spray day, you know? If, uh, if, it's, if it's a burden, you know, and you got so much other things to do, we'll work it out once a month, you know? but do it, apply it, and get it going. And the success of spraying is when you're gonna start seeing results. Oh, that's what I, want, I wanted to say is that uh, I'll give you guys the first invite if anyone wants to hit me up, but we're gonna do a live class at the KNF, KNF Cacao Farm that we transitioned from uh, Chemical Ag about a year ago now, and their farm is going off. They're harvesting white pineapples, they're cutting down banana, they're no longer bringing in mulch from the county. They're mulching with everything that we planted. So uh, she invited me to invite people. It's gonna be a very small class to go to her farm and check it out. And we're going to um, do a KNF nutrient cycling specialty class there at her farm and also tour her farm. And I'm gonna show you what we did to make it look how it looks now and what they did, not what I did, but what they did with some instruction to make it look how it looks now. Um, so that'll be cool too. And you'll see why this is important. These fundamental, simple steps are important because they no longer spray any chemicals 
They never, no longer fertilize with any chemical fertilizers. They're all KNF. They're harvesting huge pods of cacao. Their, uh, their rose beetle thing is, is basically mitigated to a non, uh, non-intrusive. It's amazing uh, because that was the first thing that I, I saw. We applied it and it transitioned and I watched it all work 100%. Just like that little video we watched from Elaine Ingham. You don't need the sprays because why? The soil's in balance. Nature's in balance. The forest doesn't need human interaction. It just takes care of itself. And that's how our farm needs to be. That's how your garden plot needs to be. Your greenhouse, your medicine bed, whatever it may be. Healthy people, healthy microbes. That's the message. Give thanks. All right.